All there, as a matter of fact. The older ones were behind glass, not in such bad shape considering. Worth a look if you've got time. A night that not only visitors to the town, but also the whole community turned up to. None of those images had been destroyed in the original purge, only those in his home, such as the one of the headmaster in the infamous three-way. Got that one embedded in my memory like a virus. <laughs> Daryl chuckled. Some things you just can't get rid of. <laughs> Jagdeep and Daryl talked about the fact that they'd have to copy the images of Lynette Denby before they could hand Phoebe's phone back. How they knew a cop in port who'd likely get the job done faster. They'd have to do it for all the phone photos, probably. Who knew what else could be on them? Mark, head hurting from the heat and constant talk, asked them to drop him off at the underground hotel, said he'd check out the photos Daryl mentioned. Look at the images from the 1989 New Year's Eve party. You never know. Done that already, Jagdeep said. Nothing of interest. Daryl turned around in his seat. I remember that party. Now that was a good one. My son was born a few weeks before, Geoffrey. Gay. Daryl gave Mark a stern look. Mark shrugged. Daryl continued. Lives with his boyfriend in robe. That's very nice, Daryl. But what about the party? Jagdeep took a corner hard and pulled up beside the underground hotel. The party. Oh, we usually checked in, in case there was any trouble. And was there? None that night, except for a dead generator which soon got fixed. No electricity before that. It was John who got it going again. When he finally arrived, the whole place cheered like idiots. Place lit up like Hong Kong after that. Days later, shit hit the fan with Denby's body being found. Well, Mark said, he'd like to take a look. The underground hotel looked as if it hadn't changed in decades. The only hint it had entered the new millennium was the free Wi-Fi sign written in faded paint on the front window. At the front desk, an ageing backpacker, too many full moon parties behind him, waved him through the doors to beyond. A pool, tiles cracked and peeling, the water needing some chemical attention. Where were the people? Surfers? Rooms with triple bunk beds, stained mattresses and signs for camel trips, diving trips and cheap meals on the walls. In the bar area, a large barbecue took up space, fake palm trees lining the courtyard. Down the stairs, an electric light read Cave Lounge. And here, photos line the wall, every inch taken up with them, a visual onslaught. Mark took a moment to navigate the pattern, for there was a pattern. Shots taken every New Year's Eve for the past 40-odd years. The more abundant images were from a time before the digital age. After that, the old gallery lost its appeal. But from the late 70s and all through the 80s and 90s, the photos were prolific and straight from the darkroom. Despite the fact that these ones were housed behind glass, the corners of the old photos were yellow, the colours fading and some difficult to decipher. Young men with big curly hair and short footy shorts grinned at him from their coveted spot. Girls in ruffle skirts waved. Good times, Mark thought. Good times. He headed for New Year's Eve 1989. A decent turnout. On that evening, it seemed, most of the town had turned up to celebrate the new decade with the backpackers. Mark stood close to the wall, looking at each photo for that year's party. A group of blonde women lounging by the pool, two tall guys, glum with VB cans in hand, an older woman in relative darkness stirring what looked to be a bowl of punch. A photo from later in the night. Fairy lights hung up around the place, flashing lights across the bar and people with their arms around each other smiling for the cameras. A group shot. People cheering, arms in the air. Happy New Year! And there was a young Daryl in uniform, grinning widely at the lens. There was John Baber, too lifting something from the same vehicle Mark had seen on Phoebe's phone. Young people around the man, helping. The generator. Daryl said John helped get it going. Mark scanned each photo from the 1989 party again. Same feel to all the years before it. 89 a little larger due to the new decade. Drunk young people celebrating life. But no Ingrid. 
No Ingrid in the photos when she said she'd arrived there that evening. Too tired, perhaps? Hung over still from the night in Port York and the long day worrying about Joanne? It was feasible. Possible that while all the drinking was going on, she was curled up in one of the dodgy bunk beds somewhere, trying to block off the noise with pillows over her ears. Possible, but difficult to reconcile with the Ingrid he once knew. Old girlfriend still in mind, Mark walked slowly past the other years, looking at all the young people frozen in time. He hovered over the New Year's Eve party of 1999, heading into 2000. Another big one. People in the pool this time, doing bombs. Obligatory group shots, images of young people in various stages of drunkenness, a sign reading, Y2K, why worry? Standard for a party on that night, but something about the year made him stop and pore over the photos again. The underground hotel in the frames appeared much as it did now. Nothing to pique the interest there. He scanned the people in the photos once more, paused at one in particular, leant in, looked at it again. From deep in the back of his mind, he felt a twist of recognition. A young man, standing between two women, his smile uncertain, a hand up as if to say, No photos, please. Mark felt a queasiness in the pit of his gut and rubbed his eyes. The young man, blonde and tall, was somehow familiar. He needed water. The photo cave was oppressive in its heat, and he stumbled out into the bar garden, searching for a drink. Finding a tap and angling his head under it, Mark took large gulps, finishing off by putting his whole head under the stream of water, shaking his hair about like a dog. He stood up, nearly refreshed, and the thought came in a rush. The young man in the photo was Sander, Ingrid's estranged husband. Chapter 25 No reason to raise alarm bells, but the man in the photo was Sander from the Netherlands. Ingrid hadn't mentioned him travelling to Cutter's End. Didn't need to, but still, it was something to file away. Something to stew over, perhaps needlessly, while he went about his work. Out of the underground hotel, the heat gave him another clout. He stood for a moment on the street, working out which way to get back to the police station. Not a big choice, right or left. He took the right, trusted his instincts, confident in them. Walked past a hardware shop selling raincoats and a butcher's, where a group of dead flies lay congealed in the corner of the sign that read, Fresh Fish. He heard the tooting of a horn and glanced up to see a ute being driven slowly beside him. Want a lift? It was the whistling woman from the night before, leaning across her seat and beckoning. He climbed into the passenger seat and said his thanks. The air conditioner blared and music played faintly on the radio. Too bloody hot out, the woman was saying. Where are you going? Police station. She slowed down, did a yui and drove back the way he came. You were heading in the wrong direction, mate, she said. On your way to the brothel, were you? He looked at her, unsure if she was joking. Never mind, she continued. Wanted to see you anyway, to say thanks. I got in touch with Gavin. Turns out I did have the wrong phone number. She tapped her fingers on the steering wheel. <laughs> I'm such a bloody dickhead. Anyway, he's coming up here in a couple of days and we'll make our way up the centre. Maybe then across the Kimberley. Get some work in Broome. Mark sat back in his seat and listened to her travel plans. To be young again, he thought. To be young and newly coupled. To be young and free. He closed his eyes, enjoying the energy in her voice and the hope in her plans. Then, she was saying, Gavin is flying back to the UK for a bit, so I'll probably hitch down the west to Perth. He opened his eyes. You'll hitchhike? Yeah, she said. What of it? He didn't answer. Thought instead of the young girl in Ingrid's hometown wanting to hitch, and his relief at her getting a lift with gravy. Hitchhiking was on the rise again. A lull, perhaps, after Malat but now gaining in popularity as travel became expensive and young people forgot the horrors of Belangelo. It would all happen again. Whistling woman pulled up in front of the police station. He said thank you and got out. She gave a friendly toot-toot and sped off down the road. Inside, Darrell had retreated to his back office. 
Mark filled Jag deep in on the photo cave wall. Ingrid's absence from the 1989 New Year's Eve party sounded there in 1999. Jag deep listened, filing it somewhere internal. You think she'd be the type to attend the backpackers' party? She asked, flicking through some other files. Yep. From what he could remember about the early days, Ingrid was never one to miss a party. The husband being there is interesting, but not much in the way of helpful, Jagdeep said. But even so, record it. Mark took out his laptop and wrote it down, including other information. Lynette Denby, Phoebe Dixon and the like. Angelo would want it all in a full report at some stage soon, something to hand to his superiors and for them to hand to theirs. Here it is. Jagdeep held up the police notes that recorded who was staying at the roadhouse on the night of the 31st of December, 1989. This is what I was looking for. She explained that after her musings on nicknames that morning, she got to thinking that most of them were derived from the family name, Smithy for Smith, Blackie for Black, Connors for Connolly. Mark waited. This was obvious stuff. They're not nicknames, he said. What are they then? abbreviations. He went to tell her about Stitcher, deciding against it. It wouldn't be worth it to explain that as a young kid in primary school, Stitcher used to go to bed in his school uniform rather than his pyjamas. When his mother found out and asked why, the little boy reportedly said, a stitch in time saves nine. Cue a lifetime of Stitcher. Even his own wife called him that. Look here. Jagdeep was looking down at the police notes. Mark stepped behind her and read over her shoulder. He'd seen the notes before. Guests of Roadhouse on the 28th to the 29th of December. Vic and Yvonne Goldstone, elderly couple caravanning, both now deceased. Guests of Roadhouse on the 30th of December. Jason Dimler. Guests of Roadhouse on the 31st of December. Jason Dimler, Joanne Morley. Cameras ordered? Check. No recorded guests for the 1st to the 5th of January. I went back and checked earlier stays too. Everyone for the whole of 1989. Not many guests in the scheme of things, but one name pops up almost every six weeks. Mark looked at the paper again and felt a jolt of realisation at one name. You're a genius, he said. You're a bloody Jason Dimmler. Dimmer. Our video distributor, most likely. Jagdeep turned and gave him a grin. The first proper one he'd seen on her. It transformed her face, made her a kid who has just come first in hurdles, a big blue ribbon taped to her front. He tapped the top of her chair. What do the cops have to say about Dimler in the first round of interviews? Back in 90, not much, as you'd expect. A resident of Port York, 22 years old, itinerant mine worker, like to drink, like to smoke. They get an address? Yeah, I'm on to it. She tapped the address into Google, face falling as she read out that Dimler's former home on the outskirts of York was now a vacant lot. Mark shoved in beside her and tapped the number of the York Hotel with the Yorkshireman working in it. Pubs, the agora of every country town. What was he even doing, he thought, calling the cop station previously. He should have known that the bar was where you sought your titbits, your experts, your credible theories. The man he now knew as Gavin answered, and when the Yorkshire lad realised who he was talking to, he became enthusiastic, describing the mix-up in phone numbers, the relief at knowing he wasn't dumped by his Australian girlfriend after all. Mark listened, nodding and smiling. Gavin continued. It was almost like fate that Mark had wandered into the pub that day. His granny back home in Easingwold told him when he left the UK that he'd meet someone in Australia, and now he had. Australian girls weren't half bad, he said. In fact, his mate had... Mark cut the young man off, asked him if he knew someone in his fifties named Jason Dimler, or Dimmer. Gavin, eager to please, said he didn't, but he'd ask the regulars and call him back. Mark hung up, feeling pleased with himself, and asked Jack Deep if she'd like a coffee, the best coffee in the world. She said she would. Daryl's disembodied voice called through the wall that he'd like one too. The place felt collegial. At the petrol station, the coffee was as miraculous as that morning. A blend of honey and almonds. A hint of cinnamon? All those coffee wankers in Adelaide didn't know what they were missing, he thought. Some would probably drive the thousands of kilometres just to have this brew, dickheads that they generally were. 
and he wasn't even including Melbourne types in the equation. They'd hire private jets to be served such a cup. He beamed at the meaty woman. You asked about the sisters yet? She said. He retracted his beam, shook his head, felt a stab of guilt. He was a bad citizen. Nodding a goodbye, he balanced the three drinks and left. Back at the police station, coffees providing cheer, Mark asked about the girls. Jagdeep shook her head. Ghost stories, almost. Gives me the creeps. Remember your blue shoe in the scrub? That sort of stuff. Daryl wiped his mouth with the back of his hand and gave a discreet burp. <coughs> I remember the girls, he said. Sisters from the southeast. Skimpies at the desert cave. Went missing after they left the job. Never seen again. Theories? Lots of theories, mate. Some said they hightailed it to Darwin, got a boat to Indonesia and left the country. Others thought that maybe a customer offered them money elsewhere, Perth perhaps, and they changed identities. I remember them. It was just a young copper then. Good-looking sorts they were, always heading back and forth to parties up and down the highway. Very popular in town. Sometimes had oddballs on their tails, so to speak. Oddballs on their tails? Jagdeep screwed up her nose. What's that? Weirdos. Hangers on. Creepy blokes, Daryl said. No good types. Sleazebags, Mark offered. I get the picture. Jagdeep sat back. What did you think happened? Mark asked Daryl. Me? What every copper thought then. Abduction and murder. The sisters finished their work, said they were getting a lift to Adelaide. Then no one ever saw them again. No cameras on the streets or in the pubs then. We followed it up as best we could. Interviews, reenactments, a bit of media. But the sightings in Cairns threw things out of kilter. A couple said they'd seen them there and we lost our momentum. The skimpy angle didn't help. People down south thought that it meant prostitute. And girls like that don't make for good news stories. When was this? Around 87, 88. Lots of backpackers then. Plenty of people reported missing. Most found within a week. Press barely looked at it. The three police officers went quiet, sipping their coffee. Daryl spoke again. Copper older than me, dead now. He was interested in that, in the missing girls. He used to spend his free time reading up on the cases, making calls and whatnot. There are a few others he was interested in too, earlier than the sisters. Nothing confirmed. When Malat was caught, we thought that maybe he'd slow down, but he didn't. Old school copper. Said there was a Malat in every town if you looked hard enough. The coffee didn't taste so good anymore. Mark sculled the rest of his and threw the container towards the bin. Missed. Jagdeep did the same. It went straight in. Daryl stood up and walked slowly back into his office, left leg not quite keeping up with his body. The phone rang. Gavin, his Yorkshire mate. Hey! The man gushed. How are you, mate? Same as about ten minutes ago, mate, Mark said. Find anything? Look here, reckons that Jason Dimler lives at the caravan park south of Port. Keeps to himself, the guy says, but a decent enough bloke. Got an address? Chapter 26 Too late now to drive down to Port York, the detectives worked out a time and which vehicle they'd take the following day. Mark would then continue on to Adelaide after the chat with Dimler. It occurred to Mark that he was overdue for an update with Angelo. Sighing as he jabbed at his phone, Mark stepped out of the office. His old colleague picked up the phone on the first ring. Mark, you find anything yet? Uh, how are you, mate? Would have been nice. How are you, mate? Good. You find anything yet? Mark tried to remember why he and Angelo had ever been friends. Something about both liking beer and Bob Dylan, perhaps? I can't talk for long. At a function. Mark pressed his ear to the phone. He could hear music and laughter, people talking. He thought about his own excitement at the $4 coffee. Perhaps he should have tried to rise up the career ladder after all. He attempted to give a brief overview to Angelo, including the revelations about the video cameras, Jason Dimler, John Baber, and the images of Michael Demby's wife, left out the bit about Sander on the photo wall. On the other end of the phone, Angelo grunted. Huh. Sounds like you've been busy, mate. 
Done enough to satisfy the naysayers, I reckon. Gone into the detail, asked the questions. On Monday, after happy family times, you can send in your report. Go back to losing at squash. I could fly home from Port York tomorrow. Or you could drive the whole way. How much does that wine you're drinking cost at your little party there? Mark asked, listening to the glasses clink in the background. It costs nothing when you consider what funds we'll be getting from the government after this election, mate. Stocks are being sold as we speak, tins are rattling, cap in hand is growing heavy. This, my friend, is called networking. Networking my ass. One more thing. Let your colleagues up there know that the forensics from Adelaide will be on site by Saturday. All approved. They said their goodbyes and hung up. Mark walked back into the office, feeling as if he'd been picked last for Year 9 Volleyball. He asked Jagdeep what Angelo meant by the forensics. We arranged it before you got here, she said. Forensics to re-examine the site where Denby was found. Probably won't find anything, but, you know, Lockhart's exchange principle. Didn't think to tell me? Jagdeep stared at him and shook her head. The ego, she said. You've only been here five minutes. We've been working on this for a month. Still, she caught his wounded expression, picked up her jacket, and gave him a pat on the shoulder. Come on, no need to crack the sads. We've done well today. Fulby's photos of Lynette, the Dimler connection, now this funding for the search. And until last night here, we've got to celebrate. How do you do that? Mark didn't feel like any of the three pubs tonight. In his three nights here, he felt that each one had made him slightly less of a human being. Kebab shop, Jagdeep answered, and he was immediately cheered. Daryl said he wouldn't come, but limped out of his hideaway office to shake Mark's hand. Got something to give you, too, the older man said. Been photocopying the old copper's notes. Stuff he collected over the years on the kids who went missing around here. You might be interested to look at it sometime. Bright fella like yourself? Plenty of time on your hands? What about Jack Deep? Daryl smiled with real fondness at his young colleague. She's been busy with a Denby file, but it's all here if she needs it. Maybe you both can work on it. Get you, he looked at Mark with hope, up this way again. You never know. Mark took the overflowing folder in one hand, shook Daryl's with the other. The kebab shop wasn't much at first glance. A faded sign, Christmas decorations a good two months early or ten months too late, hanging from the till, and a comatose man behind the counter reading The Barefoot Investor. Mark realised he was hungry, ordered chips and the beef and chilli sauce, no tomato. Jagdeep the same. They each got a can of Coke from the fridge and sat down on the plastic chairs by the window. The kebab was good. Not as good as Omar's, but still, it was the best meal he'd had since his arrival in Cutter's End. He finished, wiping the serviette over his mouth and leaning back, a happy man. You married, Jag? He asked, feeling in the after-kebab glow that they were surely now at the name-shortening stage. Why, he could have even lit up a cigarette. Jag Deep, still eating her final mouthful, shook her head. She held her hand up with a signal for wait and had a drink. Engaged, she then said. Wedding at the end of this year. Mark noted the flash of diamond on her finger. Funny, he thought. For some reason he didn't imagine her as the diamond type of person, But then again, weren't diamonds known to be hard? Difficult to break? What brings you to Cutter's End? Got seconded here. Darrell's nearing retirement and needed a hand. I pretty much volunteered for it. Extended family driving me mad. Needed some space. I've got four younger brothers and two aunts who can't stay away. (laughs) Jesus. Yeah, and trying to plan a wedding plus work and all that? Madness. Anyway, I agreed to a six-month stint in Cutter's End. It's not too bad. I like Daryl, and this case has made things more interesting. Still get down south every few weeks. Doesn't your fiancé miss you? He's a FIFO worker, fly in, fly out with the West Australian mines. Engineer. He knows the drill, pardon the pun. Lot of couples around here in the same boat. Our plan is work hard early, find a nice place to buy in Adelaide, and have a family in a couple of years. Sounds good, Mark said. It did sound good. All these plans for the future. He hoped every one of them would pan out for Jagdeep and her FIFO fiancé. Jagdeep wiped the sides of her mouth with a serviette, scrunched it up and threw it in the bin. A perfect throw again. What made you come here? She asked. Mark ran through the list. He knew people identified in the case as potential witnesses. He was apparently good at witness interviews. He was in a position to travel. 
He was on long service leave and needed a new direction. My mate, Angelo, a super, thought I needed a change. Plus, as you're aware, I'm familiar with some of the people involved. Got this job as a temporary promotion. His old friend guiding him, leading him along, Mark continuing to drift, as always. Jobs for the boys. Jake Deep turned away. Hey, I've been a cop for over 25 years, remember? About time I got a promotion. Mark heard his own voice rise in defence. You play football with a commissioner, did you? Went to school with a bigwig. Jesus, Jack Deep, I'm just doing my job. Mark reddened. Truth was, he had played football with Angelo. Jack Deep's whole body sighed. I know, she said. But for some people, blokes and Anglos, things are just easier. He couldn't deny it. Things were easier for him. His light skin, his sex, all of it. They sat in silence, gazing at the remnants of kebab and coke. He wondered whether or not to tell her about his Greek heritage, decided against. Jag Deep cleared her throat. <clears throat> Got a wife and kids, Mark? Mark nodded, grateful. One wife, two sons. All okay in that area too? She was wiping the table with a spare serviette, not looking at him. He considered her for a moment before taking the plunge. We're going through a rough patch. You have an affair or something? She looked at him steadily. Sorry, but it's just that I swear every cop I know, excluding Daryl, seems to be having an affair. Must be in the job description, but it's something I don't want to catch. Perhaps she was right. The force did seem to be filled with unhappy men and women. The difficulties of the job didn't seem to be enough of an excuse. Plenty of professions had stress and emotional baggage. Ambos, for instance. But the force... Mark wondered if it was something to do with wearing a uniform the shared vision, the sense of us versus them. Certainly when he was holed up with Jane Southern in three-star hotel rooms across Adelaide, he felt that in some way. But it wasn't the whole story. We both had affairs. It wasn't just me. Kelly with some visiting lawyer bloke and then me with a colleague. You can't just blame the force. Blame marriage, he wanted to say. Blame an institution which demands fidelity but doesn't offer a blueprint against the mind-crushing boredom of waking up to the same person day after day and the tedium of kids and routines and the treadmill of life. But then, when Kelly had her affair and told him, he'd been devastated. He felt cheated, not in the obvious sense, but in the way that all this time he'd been faithful and she'd been the one to break, not him. She wasn't in love with the guy, she'd said. It was a drunken thing with a colleague. This hurt too. A drunken thing? Kelly never got drunk with him. It seemed like years since they'd stayed up late listening to music and drinking wine or stumbling home from some gig. His reaction? An affair with Jane Southern who, it couldn't be denied, he'd been eyeing off for months. It wasn't last so much as payback. Why stay together? Jag Deep asked. He could see her point. After that, what was it all for? He'd asked himself the question more than once. He paused. The kids, at first. Our boys are young. But then, other things. There's still something there. At least I think so. We're in counselling and all that. I hope it works out. Me too, he said. And he realised, yes, yes I do hope it works out. If Adi cheats on me, I'll kick him in the balls. Mark grinned, remembering the ferocity and optimism of young love. You do that, he said. That night, the generator humming like a heartbeat, Mark couldn't sleep. Jack Deep's observations on the force, the photos, the videos, the missing girls, Kelly and the boys. He turned over, flicked on the bedside light, and located the file Daryl had passed him. A truckload of papers fell out, and he had to lean over the side of the bed to get them, the remains of the kebab churning unpleasantly as he clattered about, collecting the papers and photos. Once upright, he tried to assemble the papers into some sort of order, by the dates listed at the top of each page. There were sheets and sheets of type notes, interviews, the official, and the non. Descriptions of cars, 
people, cutouts from newspapers. So much to read. He found what he was looking for. Articles. It was 11.40pm. Darwin Advertiser, 21st of July, 1988. Skimpy's missing. Two popular skimpies from Cutter's End, South Australia, have gone missing. The skimpies, sisters originally from Warnbean, South Australia, have not been seen for three weeks. Patrons of the Desert Cave are reported to be devastated that the sister act is over and hope that the bubbly girls will be found soon. Mark sighed, deeply, read on. <sighs> Adelaide Times, 6th of July, 1988. Sisters missing. Sisters Adele and Raylene Cunningham from Warnbean, South Australia, have been missing since last week, the 28th of June. Friends and relatives say it is highly unlikely that the pair would go this long without contacting loved ones. Adele Cunningham, 22, is described as around 164 centimetres of slim build with brown curly hair. She was last seen on the road north of Cutters End, South Australia, stating to friends that she and her sister were seeking work in Darwin. She was reported to be wearing light blue shorts, white runners and a navy T-shirt. Her younger sister, Raylene, 19, is described as around 160 centimetres of medium build with brown short hair, reported to be wearing a denim skirt, high heels and a blue blouse. She was last seen with her sister on the road north of Cutter's End. It is believed that the two sisters were previously working as topless barmaids known as skimpies in the town and had left their workplace on good terms. Anyone with information is asked to call missing persons or the police on the following number. Warnbean, Mark thought. That windy, sea-swept town near Ingrid's house. With a start, he recalled the Bray Inlet barman discussing his interest in the case with missing persons, murders, local people, and Ingrid asking questions. Later, Ingrid's angry text denying she'd been talking about the Denby case. Mark rubbed his head. She hadn't been talking about Denby at all. Rather, she'd been asking questions about the sisters. But why? He read on. Owner of the Desert Cave, Ronald Keenan, claims the sisters seemed happy on their last day at work. Both girls were popular and well-liked by patrons of the cave. We've had a fundraising event here at the pub to generate funds for the search. Our thoughts and prayers go out to the Cunningham family. A photo accompanied the article. The two girls leaning on the side of a land cruiser, big hair swept up and vague smiles on both of their faces. Other pieces of information, more photographs, interviews with staff at the Desert Cave and the sightings in North Queensland, unconfirmed but firmly acknowledged by the press. Even the mother of the two girls agreed in a local rag that the hazy image in the CCTV footage outside the Cairns Hotel looked like Raylene. The father of the girls commented that he hoped they'd met two nice blokes and taken off overseas. Any other option, he said, would be too horrible to contemplate. Mark zeroed in on the CCTV image, then looked again at the pictures supplied by the parents to the police for the missing person photos. They were similar, but not conclusive. A lot of young girls have medium builds and brown hair. When it came down to it, hope was a killer. In the early hours of the morning he woke, startled by the sound of a cat outside his window. In the stillness, it sounded like a woman crying. He lay, eyes open, waiting for daylight. Why, he thought again, why was Ingrid interested in the case of the missing girls? He rubbed his eyes, turned and looked at the files scattered on the floor. Pages and pages he hadn't read yet. Witness statements, the psychic theories, the wackos from the public who wanted a piece of the action, media reports, police reports. Sighting reports. Mark's whole body sighed. There was a rush of blood to his head as he bent down to pick up some of the papers and one of the headlines first appeared to him a little blurry. He read it. Read it again. Straightened up and read the whole thing once more. Adelaide Times, 18th of October, 1982. Disappearance. 20-year-old Dutch woman Anne Modderman has been missing since the 13th of October, when she was last seen leaving the Adelaide Commercial Hotel at 8pm. 
According to close relatives, it is out of character for her to be missing this long without calling someone. Anne Moderman is described as being around 170 centimetres, of slim build, with straight blonde hair. Her bank accounts have not been accessed and her belongings at a nearby backpacker's were not collected. Friends of the young woman report that she was planning on heading to Perth and then up the west coast. At the time of her disappearance, Moderman was wearing a green denim skirt, a white jumper and sand shoes. Anyone with information is asked to call missing persons or the police on the following number. Why was an old Cutters End cop interested in this case? It was for the Adelaide coppers, not the Cutters ones. Not even Port York ones. But still, Mark thought, the old bloke may have found something. He shuffled through the papers, alert now, sensors ringing. Another one, this time a police report. Police report, Adelaide Central, 15th of October, 1982. A missing persons report was filed by 21-year-old Dutch backpacker Mika Jansen at 0900 on this day, the 15th of October, 1982. Jansen last saw her travelling companion, Isa Moderman, at around 2000 on the 13th of October, 1982, when they were both drinking at the commercial hotel, High Street, Central Adelaide. Jansen reports it is highly unusual for Moderman to travel anywhere without alerting friends and family. Of particular concern to Jansen is the fact that Moderman did not take any belongings with her. Jansen has been advised not to leave the state and police will conduct further inquiries. Mark noted the date of the report again, two days after the woman disappeared. Not likely in those days that police would be overly concerned. People came and went. 90% ended up being found within 48 hours. He checked the names again. Anne Moderman in the newspaper report and Isa Moderman in the police report. A mistake? Not a helpful one. Names and initials were of vital importance in missing persons cases. Adelaide Times, the 20th of October, 1982. Missing backpacker. Adelaide police are appealing for public assistance to help locate missing Dutchwoman Anne Moderman. The 20-year-old was last seen outside the commercial hotel in central Adelaide on the 13th of October around 8pm. An alert has been put out for Moderman's whereabouts across South Australia. Interstate police have been notified. Police and family are concerned for Anne's welfare due to her responsible personality and the length of time she has been missing. Her family state that it is unlikely she would have forgotten to phone home for her father's birthday a week ago. An image of Anne has been released in the hope someone will come forward with information about her current whereabouts. Anne had expressed hopes of working in Perth over the coming summer. The search for her has been extended to Western Australia. Anne's parents are travelling to Australia to assist with the search. Anyone with information is urged to call Adelaide Police Station on the following number. An image of Anne or Isa Moderman accompanied the appeal. She was tall and fit, blonde with a broad smile. In the photo she was laughing at something, her mouth open in delight. She might as well have been saying, Look at me, I'm having the best time of my life. The photo made Mark immeasurably sad. They always did. He thought of the one of the sisters by the vehicle, smiling into a desert wind. What were photos anyway? Memory imprints, not always true. It was what was happening behind the camera that was truly of interest. Who was watching? What they were thinking? Mark looked at the smiling Dutchwoman and recalled the date of her disappearance. The 13th of October, 1982. In that same month, in that same year... Lindy Chamberlain was wrongly convicted of murdering her baby, Azaria, at Uluru, Northern Territory. The trial of the century, the papers called it. Australians heard of little else for years. This disappearance, this case of the Dutch girl, was in all likelihood forgotten, or at the very least pushed to the bottom of a to-do pile. All hands on deck for the Chamberlains. Old coppers talked about it all the time. He wondered whether Anne or Isa was ever found. Rifled through the papers, saw nothing. But there, in the very back, was a handwritten note in careful script from the Cutter's policeman. Donna Arlington, 1980, Alice Springs. Carly North, 1980, Catherine. Isa Moderman, 1982, Adelaide. Adele and Raylene Cunningham, 1988, 
cutter's end. Mark felt the closeness of the room. He clawed at his T-shirt and ripped it off. Opened a window, let fresh air in. Warm, not cool enough. Outside, the sky was streaked with orange. Soon, Cutter's End would wake. Mark looked at the old policeman's handwritten note. He'd been keeping track of the missing women. But who were Donna and Carly? Something raced by the window, a bird or the cat again. Still, it made him jump. He stood up, drew the curtains aside. In the darkness, small shrubs looked like people crouching. He stared at one of the clumps for a long moment, half expecting it to move. Anyone could be out there. A whoosh passed the window again, and he stepped back, startled, as the cat peered through the window pane at him before darting off. Mark sat down on the bed, heart racing. He stared at the notes, an idea forming. The places on the list, all of them were along the Stuart. The highway that sliced the country in two, a thoroughfare for travellers, business, and those who favoured silence in a vast land. If Michael Denby hadn't been discovered by John Baber, he too could have been added to the list. A person disappeared. Maybe the old cop was interested in missing persons up and down the Stuart. Chapter 27 Ingrid and Nolene bobbed up and down in the gentle lull of the waves. A perfect day for swimming, if you were from the far southeast of South Australia. Clear sky, no wind and the water a brisk 15 degrees. With a full wetsuit, Ingrid was warm enough and content to float, looking up at the chilly blue of a morning sky. She thought of Joanne and the phone call they'd had earlier. Joanne admitted the anger had faded. Age does that. Fact is her old friend had said. Despite everything, I miss you, and no matter what happens, we have to stick together, always. Hearing that made Ingrid almost cry. For so long the two of them had been estranged. And for what, really? For matters of coping, for learning how to live. Joanne told her over the phone that it was Annabelle who'd encouraged her to call. At 16, friendships are vital. But at 50, the women knew they can be life-saving. Before hanging up the phone, Joanne and Ingrid had agreed to meet in Baralama and attend the school reunion together. Ingrid floated and thought about friendships, old and new. Nolene, 60 years old, was talking again about the upcoming performance of their band, Raise Hell Octavia. I'm just so nervous that I'll stuff up, she was saying. There's that part in Boys in Town where I mix up the lines. You'll be fine, Ingrid said. You've got a beautiful voice. Oh, Ingrid. It's true, Ingrid meant it. Sing it for me, Nolene. Go on, please. Nolene began, tremulous at first, and then with more confidence. Ingrid listened as she floated, watching skybirds dip and wheel in the blue above. When she finished, the women were quiet. It's such a sad song, Nolene said. Yeah, I think Chrissy Amphlett went through a really bad patch. Thanks for encouraging me, Nolene said. These past five years I've known you, you've really brought me out of my shell. Before that, well, before that I was, you know, on the brink. Ingrid caught the expression on Nolene's face, that haggard look, deflated. Tell me a story about Adele and Raylene, she said. Nolene gave a short laugh, more of a bark. Oh, you like hearing about them, don't you? I do. I like the sound of them. I wish I had sisters. Nolene ducked under the water and came up again. They loved music. Yeah? They would have laughed to see me doing this. Their big sister Nolene in a band. I can just hear Adele. No way! The older woman was quiet. She lay back again and floated. I miss them so much. You going to tell me a story about them? No. I don't feel like it today. Okay. 
It's just that I like talking about them, but afterwards I almost feel worse. It's the not knowing. The women felt the waves lifting them up, letting them down, gently, and with only a vague sense of the force that lay below. Nolene splashed some water about, the droplets like jewels across her lined face. Why don't you tell me a story? You know everything about me, and I know hardly anything about you. Tell me a good story from your past. Ingrid looked at her, her friend's head half in the water and the grey hair floating around like an old mermaid. How fortunate she was to have found her, and Nolene was so open with the events of her life, the tragedies. Surely she deserves something back. Okay, she said. I'll tell you something. It's about when I was young, 22 or 23, and just drifting around the country, no direction, bit like Chrissy A. Nolene laughed, started heading back to shore. Tell me while we're going back in, she said. My arms are getting tired. We can rest in the shallows. Okay. And Ingrid told Nolene a story from her past. Not the most significant one, perhaps, but one which signalled a change in direction and led her, she was aware, right to this very moment. I had this old friend, Joanne. After school, we travelled together but lost contact. She headed to Sydney. I kept on travelling around, odd jobs and so forth. She was always much more focused than me. Anyway, this one time, I was in Sydney and I thought I'd visit. She was living with her new boyfriend in Bronte, this beautiful place right on the coast. I rocked up to their house, already half cut, with a packet of fags, ready to reminisce. Nolene nodded, enjoying the story. By now the women were lying in the shallows, oblivious to the morning walkers and the surf school setting up down the beach. There was, however, no catching up on old times. Ingrid gave an ironic laugh. The first thing Joanne told me when she answered the door was that I had arrived in the middle of a lunch party. She said she was entertaining new friends. Could I come back later? Nolene gave a low whistle. Whew, harsh, she said. A lunch party, I cried. What the hell is a lunch party? Then I called down the hall. Are you all enjoying cucumber sandwiches, ladies? (laughs) But my old pal didn't find it funny. Ingrid grimaced. Instead, she shuffled me into this spare room and told me to get a grip. No, Nolene said and shook her head. Yes, and I tell you, Nolene, it came out as an accusation. I felt this terrible sense of shame. Get a grip is a difficult thing to hear for someone like me in her early 20s who has no idea what she's doing in life, who's drifting, who feels sick with guilt every single day. Nolene clucked in understanding. She rested for a moment, her cold hand on Ingrid's wet-suited arm. So I stormed off down this long, steep hill to the beach. I was furious disgusted in myself and at my shitty life. I took off my shoes, jeans and jumper and swam out past the few swimmers and surfers. There was a pause, and the women sat up and looked out to sea. Whoa, that's rough, Nolene said. Not finished yet, Ingrid replied. So, I was just lying there floating. It was so nice, you know, up and down, up and down. Then, A rush of water beneath shook me, and as I turned on my stomach to see what it was, a flash of white raced below. Another rush of water, and this time I saw the body of a shark. I saw its eye. I froze. I seriously froze. My God, Nolene said. What did you do? Ingrid could remember it clearly, how a voice within her screamed, Go! and how in a blur of fear she saw her initials, I-A-M, imprinted in her mind. They just came to her, and at the same time, she began to move, arms mechanical and face to the shore. I swam like crazy to the beach. In the corner of her mind, she remembered the desperate movements of the other surfers, and a grey fin disappearing into the swell. Head down, kick! The scream became a mantra, 
and she powered through the water, arms pumping, legs kicking strong into the shallows where she ran, aching up the beach, collapsing on the sand. And when I got there, all these surfers started coming in and we couldn't believe it. We just started laughing. It was like this amazing experience, terrifying, but galvanizing too. Nolene was laughing. (laughs) That's a great story, she said. But I can't believe you told it to me while we were in the ocean. (laughs) Ha <laughs> I thought you'd appreciate that. Later, back in her little house with the fire lit and the lamps giving off a rosy glow, Ingrid wondered why she chose that story and the other things about it she didn't tell. How, after that day on the beach and later that night, when she was slipping and sliding beneath the surfer in some Bondi bedsit, he asked her if she wanted to join him in Byron Bay for a couple of weeks. But as much as she could appreciate his lithe body and easy charm, she was already planning ahead. That eye, the fear, and then the initials of her name in her mind, like a sign. Ingrid took a sip of wine and thought briefly of calling Sander. Above her in the painting, Penelope bit on her thread, oblivious to the suitors outside. She must be so bored, Ingrid thought, looking at the painting. She should go for a swim in the Aegean or something. Ingrid had another sip of wine, gazed at the Greek woman working, and thought more fondly of her. After all, she couldn't be too harsh on Penelope. The woman was plotting even as she waited for her husband. Far from being idle, she was weaving and unravelling, weaving and unravelling. But Penelope couldn't wait forever. No one could. She wiped her brow and put her glass down. Here it was. Ingrid could feel it again. A darkness unfurling. The spreading outward of anticipation or fear. She picked up the phone and called her friend's number. Nolene, she said. Can you come around? I need to tell you something. Chapter 28 Friday. Bag packed, in the car, on the way out of town, Mark felt a hint of regret. Not for Cutter's End itself, with its streets like sandpaper and the shops tired and drab. Not for the pubs with their general vibe of hell, but rather for the fact that he'd never taken one of the walks John Baber told him about. Now, driving down the highway towards Port York, he could see the varied tones of the land, the rich chocolate browns of the hillocks, the pale dusky sand, the olive green of the shrubs, and clouds like chariots. He would have liked to go on a walk with Baber and listen to the quiet man tell him the names of the plants and the places beyond. But that was for another time. Jagdeep and Mark didn't talk as they sped by the roadhouse. He caught a brief glance of Sean out the front and noted the welcome sign, faded. Mark's phone rang, the journo from the Port York advertiser. Tell me, Mark said, you've solved it. Who was there on the grassy knoll? The journo laughed and coughed. (laughs) Uh, That's for next year's assignment, mate. As for this day, I've been working out where to put your Have You Seen? It'll be in tomorrow's edition and we'll help you find your mystery driver. Be good. Thing is... The journo said. I had a little delve into media reports on your case. Went back, looked at the victim, Denby. Mark put the journo on speaker. Jagdeep bent her ear to listen. You know he was awarded a medal for bravery, right? Yeah. Thing is, when you get nominated for one, in this case by the Miller family, you've got to have other people back it up, put forward glowing statements about your general character. They're always made available to the public. Okay. Interesting side note, Denby didn't get a whole lot of supporting statements. Two, in fact. One from a guy who knew him at school, and another from Adelaide, who was in business with him briefly. None from Cutter's End. The paper wanted to publish all the praise, pump the man up, but they could only get hold of these two statements. Why's that, you reckon? Mark glanced at Jagdeep. Couldn't tell you. And then, Denby's funeral. The paper had a small piece on it accompanied by a photo. You'd think, for such a hero, the whole town would turn up, wouldn't you? Yes, you would. Jagdeep rolled her eyes at Mark. 
Well, I'd like to think I'd get a few more at my funeral than he did, and I'm a prick. The photo shows about six people looking sad, and two others bored shitless. Thanks for letting us know. This investigation getting sticky? The man had a true journalistic nose. No, mate, just reinvestigating again. Fair enough. Look, you find any more, let me know, OK? Name's Hugh. Jagdeep mouthed an emphatic, not a chance. And Mark shook his head with vigour. Sure thing, Hugh. The journo hung up, busy sniffing other matters, chasing other dodgy leads. More evidence that Michael Denby wasn't as popular as he seemed. Cutter's end people were nonplussed by his achievements. Jagdeep indicated her notebook. Mark recorded the conversation. More details. Circumstantial, but growing. In Port York, they stopped off at a cafe for lunch. The man serving them said he could make them a cappuccino, but without any froth. Jagdeep declined. Mark said yes, out of interest. It wasn't too bad, but he missed the froth. While he drank, Jagdeep filled him in on the forensic search of the site arranged weeks ago. With new technologies such as 3D imaging, whole crime scenes could now be reconstructed in minute detail. Everything from bloodstains to bone fragment evidence could be mapped and then analysed for police and court. The latest findings in DNA science would also help if the forensics came across anything new. It was Suzanne Miller's influence, Jagdeep and Mark agreed, that had galvanised the force to find funding for the search. People like her and her husband moved in the type of circles that listened. Mark thought of his old mate Angelo, whining and dining it with the cream of politics and the force. It probably did pay to network. Just seemed like a shit of a job. On the road out of town, they drove into a camping ground which had seen better days. Tired caravans lent like war veterans into flaking carports and an outdoor barbecue sat overgrown with blackberry vines. No jumping pillow at this joint. No games nights. No kids club. No cashed-up grey nomads living the middle-class dream. Jason Dimler's place of residence? An old Jayco van with a rusted roof, a sagging annex, and a door shut with string. They knocked. Knocked again. You smell that? Mark sniffed the musky air, dense with weed. A tall figure came to the door, stooping to answer through the metal and twisted flywire. A cough. Coming out, the voice said, and out stepped Jason Dimler. Nick Cave-like, without the suit and smoking a fat joint. He clocked Jagdeep's uniform. I use this for medicinal purposes, he said, cocking his head back towards the van. Got the paperwork. We're not interested in weed, Jagdeep said. We're reinvestigating the death of Michael Denby at the start of 1990 up near the roadhouse. Just want to ask you about your association with Gerald Cuxton, former roadhouse owner. And distributor of illegal videos, Mark added. At this, Dimler straightened, his long frame extending like a tent pole. I never made any videos. And I haven't seen Cuxton for years. Heard he died. You're Jason Dimler, friend of the now deceased Gerald Cuxton, regular visitor of the roadhouse? Maybe. What can you tell us about the videos Gerald used to make, where he kept the tapes, stuff like that? Am I in trouble? If you don't tell us what you know, we can take you down to the station and continue the discussion there. Jagdeep said. We can talk about your use of weed, too. Ask to see those medicinal forms. Dimler sighed, butted out the roach, and took a packet of fags from his back pocket. He offered one to Mark and Jagdeep before shrugging and lighting up. Cuxton was a fuckhead. He said, breathing in the smoke. Sick bastard when I think of it. Paid me to set up cameras and all the dongers, then sell the videos to kids in Port and Adelaide. He used to edit them, black out faces and whatnot. No sound. Once, some bloke whose wife was in one came around and gave Cuxton a what for. Same bloke ended up in hospital with a broken leg and very few teeth. Dimler took another drag. The others didn't interrupt. <sighs> Video sold like fucking hotcakes. Kids, old perverts, travellers. Mostly not much in them. Not everyone gets a root in a donger, but enough, you know. And always tits from the showers. Why work for him? Set up the cameras, sell the videos. It was work, mate. Look around you. Not much employment here. 
especially not if you've only got year eight and a habit to maintain. Didn't make me feel noble, but it paid. So what happened to the videos made around the time of Denby's death? Destroyed, mate. Big fucking fire and a lot of fucking petrol straight after word got out about the dead bloke up the road. Cuxon was a fuckhead, but he wasn't stupid. He knew the cops would be sniffing around, maybe even staying there during the investigation. After five or six months, when the heat died down, he put the cameras back up, started up selling again, but they were never as popular. Videos were becoming old school, you know? Mark rubbed his head. Soon, he will be out of here, in his air-conditioned lease car, down to Adelaide, and home. It couldn't come quick enough. Did Cuxton ever mention Michael Denby? Not that I know of. Did you ever have dealings with Denby yourself? No, I mainly sold the videos in Port York and mostly to young blokes. Denby could have been buying direct through Cuxton. Wouldn't know. You ever see Michael Denby? Jagdeep showed Dimler a photo from her phone. On New Year's Eve, 1989? Long time ago, mate, but no, not that I recall. Jason Dimler was a good interviewee. Clear and precise. No hedging about or eyeballs to the sky. Mark tried a different tack. You notice a girl staying in the room next to you that New Year's Eve? That would have been around the time Denby went missing, eh? Yeah. No. However, and full disclosure here, memory's not too good, you know? Struggle sometimes to remember dates and faces. (laughs) Funny that. Yeah, Mark thought, looking at the man who resembled Nick Cave in more ways than one. Funny that. Jagdeep's shoulders slumped. What a bloody waste of time. Still got some tapes, but Dimler nodded. Yeah, one's from the last few days of the big burn. Didn't have time to get rid of the whole lot. Two or three years of tapes. Jesus, I nearly died of the fumes. A flicker of excitement ran through Mark. You got tapes from all the cameras? The one from the road. The one from the road, he thought. Let there be one from the road. Yeah, from the last few days around New Year's, probs from all the cameras. Don't bother to go destroying only some angles and not the others, mate. We'll need them now, please. All you've got. The man was in no position to argue. Bending back down inside his van, he shuffled about for a few minutes, mumbling, lighting up another smoke. Mark and Jack Deep stood outside, waiting in the dirt. There was a lot of banging and crashing and swearing. Eventually, after 15 minutes, the tall man reappeared, this time holding a washing basket of black videotapes. Here's your first lot. Wait a minute and I'll get the rest. Jack Deep looked in dismay at the basketful. As Dimler turned to head into his van again, Mark had a sudden thought. Jason, he said, Did you know Michael Denby's kids? Had a son, Troy, and a daughter, Kylie. She was about your age or a bit younger. Lived in Port York for a time. Killed herself. The lanky man leant against his van door and gave the question a bit of thought. Couldn't tell you about the son, but Kylie, yeah. I knew her. Nice girl. Bit troubled in that. What do you mean? Jack Deep sounded tired. Death of her mum and dad, drugs here and there, problems with housing... Moved down south soon after. Didn't see her after that. She ever talk about her father? Never talked about that sort of stuff. Only knew her to have a chat. Sad that she killed herself. Don't know what it is with all these young kids topping themselves. You can't tell who hides trauma, can you? The face. It's such a good actor. Dimler looked thoughtful for a moment, and Mark stood back impressed with the insight. What exactly could someone like Dimler have been if he'd gone to a private school, if he'd had opportunities and money? A different Dimler, but still Dimler nonetheless. As he pondered, the tall man turned back inside, crashing and pulling at things, before stumbling back out again with another load of videos. Jagdeep's face fell even further. That's for the last few days of taping before we started up again after the shit died down. Dimler nodded as they began shifting through them, looking on the side for dates. 
Some dated and some not. He said, When the body was found, any sort of organisation went out the window in the rush to get them disappeared. (coughs) He coughed and spat to the side. (coughs) Been eating those two baskets back too. For laundry and that. Jason Dimler and laundry. The two didn't match. Even so, they emptied the tapes into the police car and handed back the baskets. Not in any trouble now, am I? Dimler asked. Full cooperation in that. Jag Deep looked at the scores of tapes. We'll see, she said. Chapter 29 A spare office was found for them by a tired cop at the Port York station, and they settled into their new room. Files laid out, tapes on the table, in some sort of order. First, they ran through the tapes looking for road shots. It was boring work. The old VHS police video player swallowed and spewed out the tapes like a weary soul nursing a hangover. In a painful process, they worked through the videos to determine which ones came from the road camera and which ones from the dongers. A slight deterioration marked some of them, but the old videos held up remarkably well. Jagdeep confirmed that there were six cameras in all, four in the rooms and two outside, one facing one set of petrol bowsers and on the road pointing south. Whoever Gerald Cuxton feared or suspected came from that way. Then, sorting the tapes into order. Any tapes before the 31st of December 1989 were put to one side. That left 38 tapes from the 31st of December to the 5th of January. The next step was to watch the tapes from the road camera, but by that time both Jagdeep and Mark were fading fast. No amount of tea or coffee could keep them awake, and they walked the block to their hotel, agreeing to begin early the next morning. It was only when he woke in a stupor at 11.45pm that Mark realised he hadn't told Kelly he'd be arriving home the following day, and not that very night. He tried calling, left a sucky message, hung up feeling like a shitbox, which was pretty much the same as knowing he was. The next morning, sky like a bleached canvas, they walked to the police station once more. A cop on duty there kindly offered to pick them up breakfast and came back later with two pies and a couple of iced coffee Big M's. Do I look like a treaty? Jagdeep grumbled, squirting the sauce on her pie and inadvertently on her top. The road videos were tedious, the time frame uncertain. It was torture to watch the screen, slow down on the cars, searching for hints of something they weren't sure of. What they were hoping for was a hunch, a gut feeling, that flicker of unease. Mark had a maid who liked to go hiking in the high country, a real outdoor ed Bear Grylls type without the hype. One time, he told Mark, he spent two whole days hiking in the mountains and came across a wide stream, deep and clear enough for swimming. It was great, he said. The sounds of the Australian bush, the water, the birds, the solitude. Then, when night came, he lit a fire and sat in his chair beside it, facing the river and watching it darkly gurgle and flow. It was weird, he said. But when darkness struck, He immediately felt the hairs on the back of his head stand up. A feeling of fear came to him, and he had no idea why. He stood up, turned behind him, shone his torch into the bush beyond. But nothing. Once more he sat in his chair and tried to enjoy the river, and once more the feeling of fear came over him. He felt, inexplicably, that someone, or something, was watching him. Hey! he called out into the bush. Hey! It gave Mark the creeps just to think of it. His mate said that after a third time of trying and failing to sit and enjoy the river, he got up, picked up his chair, and moved it to the other side of the fire so that he was facing the bush with the river behind him. Instantly, he said, the fear went away. When Mark asked him what his theory was, His friend said he wasn't sure, but put it down to some primal instinct, a need to have a clear vision of where your danger is going to come from. 
With the fire and bush in front of him, his power somehow increased. Instinct. That's what Mark was waiting for as he watched the road videos. The camper trailers. The caravans. The road trains passing by and mostly not stopping at Gerald Cuxton's petrol station. Time slowed and Mark became fidgety. A bus pulled up on the 31st of December around 11am and a group of people got out, mostly young. Jagdeep scanned the images to see if they could make out Ingrid, but no. The camera was focused firmly on the road and only the parking area and the edge of a petrol bowser were visible. Only the dark figures of the group walking towards the shop. They tried zooming in, but it was no good. Ridiculous, Mark thought. Why waste all this money on a camera facing towards the road? Police was the obvious answer. But still... Jagdeep said she could send it for analysis. Maybe the tech guys could see if there was anyone of interest in the group. Mark shrugged. Why not? Later on, around 4.20pm in the same tape, Mark noticed something. A covered ute driving up the road, stopping at one of the Bowsers. He grabbed the Jagdeep's arm. It was Michael Denby's vehicle. The rego plate clear. The camera showed only the back half of the vehicle. They rewound the tape, putting it in slow motion. There's Denby's ute driving up the highway. There it is, pulling into the first Bowser, a hand reaching out to grab the petrol nozzle, and then filling up the vehicle tank and jerry cans. There's a pause. Presumably while Denby goes in to get his snacks and drinks and pays for the petrol. It's a few minutes till he comes out again, having had a chat, they knew, with Cuxton about his motor. A thick leg comes into shot. Denby is putting something in the back of the ute or rearranging it or something. Then he gets in and is gone. It's the last time he will drive this stretch of road. The police officers looked at each other. It was like seeing the hint of a ghost. The big legs, one of which would later be broken, and the ute, half blown up down the track. How long did Michael Denby have to live? Two hours? Twelve? They turned to the other videos, their enthusiasm revived. But not for long. One hour and thirty minutes later, in the back of the police station in Port York, Mark and Jagdeep were still sifting through tapes, backwards from the 4th of December. Mostly, the tapes were mind-numbing. People getting in and out of cars, people stretching, filling petrol, checking tyres, leaning against vehicles, walking to and fro. They came to the tapes set up in the portables, began watching. What for, exactly? The day took on an air of defeat. Why even buy an illegal tape set up in a donger? Jagdeep said. Who would want to watch that shit? Mark thought, Hope. Every young boy who bought a tape was probably told they were getting a bird's eye view of Swedish backpackers hard at it, preferably with each other. For the most part, the kids were badly ripped off. Almost nodding off now, Mark and Jagdeep watched the grainy footage of a basic room, basic bed, basic bathroom. Mark yawned, glancing at his watch. <sighs> I've got to go soon. Get home to Kelly and the kids. He began putting his notes in a bag, then checked around to see where his jacket was. Hey, Mark. Jagdeep was staring intently at the screen. You'll want to see this. He turned to see Joanne in the frame, long hair covering her face and her thin build stepping up into the small space of the donger. It shouldn't have been a surprise to see her there. They knew she stayed at the roadhouse on the 31st. But he had that eerie feeling again, as if he was watching a ghost. On the screen, Joanne sat on the bed, put her hair up, let it down again. I'm not sure I want to watch this, Mark said. It felt wrong to be spying on his old friend. Sure, Jagdeep said. We're pretty much done here anyway. But as she went to flick the off button, the door of the donger opened again. Mark and Jagdeep sat stunned, heads bent close, as on the screen, Ingrid entered the room. Ingrid, who was supposed to be 300 kilometres away in Cutter's End by then. 
Holy fuck. Mark breathed. In grainy black and white, they saw Ingrid sit down beside Joanne, then stand, her back towards the camera, facing Joanne. They looked as if they were deep in discussion, Ingrid shaking her head, before Joanne pushed past her and went into the bathroom. Mark closed his eyes for a brief second, a spreading sickness in his chest. Oh God, Jagdeep was saying. She's laughing. Mark snapped open his eyes and leant close in again, his face almost touching the screen. It did look as if Ingrid was laughing. Her mouth, a rectangle, head thrown back and hands on her sides. Facing the camera, it felt as if she was addressing them. I've been here the whole time, she may as well have been saying. Didn't you know? Chapter 30 1994 Head down kick. When Ingrid returned to her family home after her travels and the failed visit to Joanne in Bronte, she had been energised. New ideas crackling, bubbling. Finally, she knew what she wanted to do. Head down, kick. She told herself as she went about her research in the library and online. Kick, she told herself, every time she felt unsure what it was she was doing and the reason why. Seeing the shark, swimming to shore and the relief afterwards had given her a release. Not that she had been in any real danger. The lifeguard told her and the hyped up surfers that it was probably just a curious bull shark. But when her mind told her, head down, kick, and her body obeyed, that was the thing. The action, the release. It was as if a different person emerged from the water than the one who had entered it. A baptism. In the months that followed, Ingrid found she had a knack for research, an ability to find obscure details in articles, to spend long hours poring over maps and analysing photographs. All she needed was a name or even the hint of one. Who knew it was within her? Not her. When asked what she was doing, she'd answer, studying. And this was enough to satisfy her parents and most friends. It was studying. Just not for credit points. She bought a return ticket to London and left Australia on a bright day in February. On the plane over, she looked out her window and observed that from above, clouds look a little like churning waves. Easy to get lost in them. Drown if you didn't know what you were doing. In London... She met up with school friends living in a Cricklewood share house and stayed with them for a few nights, drinking in local pubs and dancing in Soho clubs. It was fun. But she only really began to feel as if she was away from home when she caught a train down south and went hiking in Kent and Sussex. Her friends had told her a lot about England, but not that it was beautiful. The green fields and forests of oaks, big rivers running clear and full, the bridal ways and kissing gates. She didn't know much about these. It was a marvel to her how almost every patch of land seemed to be managed in some way but still retained its beauty. Wooden fences, sheep, hay bales, houses, villages, castles, manors, roads and signposts. Every part of the UK was taken up. It would be almost impossible to get lost there and this gave her great comfort how easy it would be to get a job in one of the little pubs, rent a room in a village and live quietly for a few years. The idea was tempting and, as she drifted past a sign on a pub named the White Hart in a village called Penshurst, she almost gave in. She could live in one of the rooms at the top of the inn, go for long walks, get to know the country. She could change her name, be someone else entirely, maybe something like Eloise or Henrietta or Alexandra Winter. That would be great. No one would ever know who she really was, and Winter was a very cool surname. A lorry drove past, beeping its horn as the owner waved goodbye to someone. The noise made her jump, feel shivery in her legs. The next day, she booked her flight to Amsterdam. Hundreds of thousands of people. It was as if every tourist in the world zipped up their suitcase on wheels 
and arrived in the Netherlands on the same day. Tourist groups with the same coloured umbrellas. Groups taking photos. Bachelor parties. Hens parties. Lecherous divorcees slinking among red alleyways. Tour buses. Bike tours. Tulip tours. Sex tours. Amsterdam was exhausting. Beautiful, no doubt, but exhausting. As she sidestepped pools of vomit while crossing a canal bridge, Ingrid checked her phone for the address once more. Four blocks along and she was in a quieter part of the city. Lights from the houses were beginning to flicker on and the reflection in the canal was peaceful and calm. Ingrid stood in front of a tall, slender house, brown bricks with long windows and series of steps leading up to the first floor. The house looked like a graceful lady, stooping with age and experience. The image somehow made her feel reassured, and Ingrid mounted the steps, knocking firmly on the door in a show of confidence. A few moments passed, then a shadow appeared behind the glass panel. The door opened and a tall woman appeared, around 30 years old, with light brown hair cut fashionably short and a black dress complete with a grey stone necklace and earrings. She was impossibly stylish. Yeah, the woman asked. I'm wondering if Mika Janssen lives here. Are you here to complain about the rubbish? The woman spoke in perfect English. Because I have nothing to do with that side of things. I am working on the Cori project. Ingrid had no idea what she was talking about. She shook her head. I'm here to see Mika Janssen. I am Mika. Ingrid shifted about in her Birkenstocks and went to speak again. The older woman interrupted her, held up her hands. If you are here about the dirty streets, go to Janka for that. I can give you the council address, but you really must stop coming to my home. I don't know what you mean. I'm not here about the rubbish or the campaign, Ingrid said. You're not? No. Thank God. The older woman stepped out of the house and stood on the top step next to Ingrid. It's all I have to deal with these days. Rubbish and gory, gory, gory. I'm here about Isa Moderman. There was a sharp silence. Wind whipped. The canal surface became jagged with colour. Are you the police? The woman's voice was hard. No, nothing like that. Is there any news? No. So maybe you want to write a book or an article or make a documentary? I want to know where her family lives. Mika took out a small case of cigarettes from a pocket in her dress and lit one up. She didn't offer one to Ingrid. You want to tell me why you're in the Netherlands? I can't. Not until I've spoken to Isa's family. The woman took a long drag of her cigarette and blew out slowly. She looked towards the canal where the lights reflected a yellow glow as more houses and shops opened up for the night. I haven't spoken to them for at least ten years. In the beginning I stayed in contact, but it was just too difficult for them. I reminded them too much of her, you see. I just want to speak to them, nothing else. Mika closed her eyes. Your accent, she said. It's hard for me to hear. Yes. I actually knew her as Anne. Isa was her official first name. It's just everyone knew her as Anne. We don't have the tradition of middle names like you do, but sometimes we have two first names. I'm not sure how much it helped or hindered. Sometimes the press went with Anne and sometimes with Isa. It had hindered. Months of looking for the wrong person, following ghosts. Will you let me know where her family lives? Mika gave her a sideways glance. I think I will, she said. You don't look like a reporter and you've come a long way. She went back inside and came out again with a small piece of paper. I don't know the modern man family's exact address, but I know they went back to Friesland. Good luck. Ingrid took the piece of paper. Thank you she said. I hope you find Corey. 
The woman looked surprised, then gave a laugh. Gori isn't one person, she said. It's the name we are beginning to give to the new type of tourists around here. Usually English, usually a male aged 18 to 24, usually drunk and stumbling around the red light district. Sounds like a nice person. I'm on the Amsterdam Tourism Board. We're looking at ways to mitigate the Gori problem. In years to come, I hope there will be a fully funded campaign. For now, it's just me battling on. Ingrid headed down the steps, turning before she walked up the canal path once more. I can see that tourism is a problem here, she said. It's kind of awful. Mika butted out her cigarette. There are worse kinds of people than a Kori, she said. You should know that. Chapter 31 Friesland, 1994 When she first saw him, he was running, at first a speck in the distance, way down at the bottom of a field of daffodils, and gradually a tall, thin pencil. And then he was running past, sweaty and slowing down, distracted by his watch. Good time? she asked. He glanced up at her standing on the edge of the path and frowned. He nodded towards the daffodils. You want me to take a photo of you? Ingrid looked at the camera she was holding at her side. What? No, she said. He bent down to tighten his shoelaces, and she could see him studying her out of the corner of his eye. Perhaps he thinks I'm going to mug him. She cleared her throat. <clears throat> what I meant was... She said more slowly. Are you completing your run? She mimicked running. In a good time, she pointed to an imaginary watch. The young man straightened. Goodbye, he said, voice clipped, and began running once more. Ingrid sighed and continued walking, shoulders hunched, in the same direction as the runner along the path out of town. She thumbed the slip of paper in her pocket that had the address and thought about packing the whole idea in. An old lady walked past, pushing a trolley, thick legs working overtime, brown shoes worn thin. The night before in the Friesland backpackers, Ingrid lay on her top bunk and felt the weight of distance bear her down. Europe, so far from home. Her country town by the river may as well have been on another planet. The beds in her dorm were bare, backpackers and tourists preferring the nightlife and reputation of Amsterdam. No couples trying to quietly shag. No loud snorers. No giggling drunks at 3am. Ingrid missed them all. Come back. She thought of the time she'd cursed drunken lovers in bunks below her. The time she'd yelled at people who were threatening to spew. Come back. All is forgiven. The mattress she lay on creaked sadly every time she turned. What she wouldn't give for a couple of Corys to walk in, just so she could listen to them talk. It was funny all those times at school spent dreaming about the day she'd go backpacking. The places she'd see, the people she'd meet, the nights out raging she'd have. That game with her friends, spinning a globe and putting a finger on what country they'd end up living in. It was all about adventure and the richness of life. What she'd never imagined was loneliness, or that travel was really another word for escape. She looked at the bunk across from her. What she wouldn't give for her old friend Joanne to be lying there. Not the Joanne of beachside Bronte with her tiny earrings and discreet gold necklace, but the old Joanne from year nine and ten. Joanne! who dared them all to swim a lap in their school uniforms in the seniors' pool. Joanne, who of course was the first to do so. She was so daring and cool. Ingrid would have done anything for her, anything. Ingrid hugged herself, ran her hands up and down her body, grabbing at the thin material of her nightie. It would be so nice to have a boyfriend. Someone to tell her she was okay that what she was doing was fine. Horrified to feel a sob coming on, she pressed her face into the pillow. 
all this wandering and wishing. And what for, after all? Now walking down the daffodil-lined path, Ingrid had the same thought. What for? She passed two tourists who clambered down the path into the daffodils and started taking photos. Were they Corys? She didn't know. But they were idiots, trampling on the yellow flowers and posing with their prepared smiles. Ingrid felt the paper in her pocket again, wondered about her recent faltering resolve, thought about the years of drifting and stalling and not sleeping, and then remembered with a jolt the shark's eye and the grey body whipping by. Her strides lengthened. She forced herself to breathe in and out in a rhythm. She looked straight ahead, and her body moved as she willed it. Inhale. One, two, three, four, five, and exhale. One, two, three, four, five. She may have given up competitive swimming at the end of school, but the lessons it taught her really may have saved her life. One, two, three, inhale. The path turned and she entered a little village. Grey stone houses on either side, muddy front gardens juxtaposed against the brilliant yellow of the daffodil fields behind. She studied her paper again, counted the house numbers and stopped outside 16. It had been as simple as looking in a telephone book and asking the woman on reception at the backpackers to find her the exact address. No different from all the rest. The house was neat and grey and without character. A small red car was parked out the front. A bike leant against the wall beside the door. She knocked. Heavy footsteps came down the hall and a tall, dark figure appeared behind the frosted glass. She stood back a little, half afraid, and suddenly at a loss for what to say. The door opened and Ingrid began to speak. You, the person said. What is it now? I'm here about Isa. The man she'd seen running studied her for a long time. Are you Australian? Yes. He sighed, turned around and began walking back down the hall. The door was left open. She stood for a moment on the step, hesitating. Can I come in? She called out. If it is about Anne, the voice called back. Then yes, you can. But I don't know how long we'll let you stay. Ingrid took a breath and stepped into the hall. Chapter 32 Mark called Ingrid on the drive from Port York to Adelaide. No answer. He called again. Nothing. Radio on, he drove. Miles and miles of flat earth and scrappy shrubs and heat baking the earth like some hellish furnace. October. Should it be this hot? He wound down the window and stuck his arm out, waving it in the headwind. It was easy to see how people could die out here. Each year, people walked their way to death, lost and confused. He recalled stories from years past, people driving off the side of the road to camp, getting bogged in the sand, becoming disorientated and walking in the opposite direction from the road. He'd always wondered why they didn't just follow the tyre tracks, but now it was obvious. The wind. The hot westerly wind swept over everything. Even now, with his arm waving in the air, he could see a fine layer of red dirt on his skin. Sand will cover us all in time, he thought. But out here... You can see it coming. And what a way to go. Mad with thirst, weak with heat, and the sand cutting into you, getting in your throat, making you hoarse. Yelling wouldn't work out here. Mark imagined someone clawing the desert air. He brought his arm inside, wound up the window, rang Ingrid again, and this time she answered. Ingrid, he said. She sounded harried. You'll need to tell me why you lied about staying in the roadhouse. What are you talking about? It sounded as if she was carrying something heavy, 
her voice slightly out of breath. We've seen video footage. There were cameras in the rooms at the roadhouse. You didn't think about that? You were there, when, by your own testimony, you had already hitchhiked to Cutter's End and were staying in the underground hotel. A silence. He imagined her thinking, brow furrowed, looking at the floor. So what? She said. So what if I was there? It was 30 years ago, Mark. Even so, you... Can you remember 30 years ago? Well, for something like that, I think I'd... Do you remember pushing me into a wall? Mark took a moment to register the words. He indicated left, pulled sharply over to the side of the road. Say that again? I said, do you remember pushing me into a wall? It was after the pub one night. I had a bruise on my shoulder for weeks. Mark felt his heart beating. He held a palm to his forehead, closed his eyes. I think that is something I would remember, Ingrid. It's not true. Isn't it, Mark? Have a think. Think back to all those years ago at school when you were some big football hero and I was your little lackey girlfriend. I don't remember it that way. Difficult to remember things we feel uncomfortable about, isn't it? Ingrid sounded as if she was on the edge of tears. They're there, though. Hidden under scabs. I never pushed you, Ingrid. He wouldn't forget something like that. Surely. There was a sigh on the end of the line. <sighs> what do you want from me? He looked out to the long road ahead, end or beginning, nowhere in sight. We need to know why you lied about staying in the roadhouse on the night of New Year's Eve. Why tell us you got a lift with someone who smelled like bacon? Jesus, he thought. The whole thing sounded ridiculous. Mark? There was a hard edge to her voice. I hitchhiked a lot. I stayed in a lot of places. It was a long time ago. But you said the same story to the police ten days after the body was found. I didn't tell them about the smell. I told you. Why did you tell me that? I don't know. His car smelled of bacon. Why wouldn't I tell you that? You were desperate for something new, so I told you that. The conversation was becoming absurd. All these lies and mistruths and half-truths. He was tired of it. Mark tried once more. I'm going to report this. My colleague probably already has. You've lied, Ingrid. At a time when a man went missing and was found dead not ten kilometres from where you were. And now, right now, you're lying. I've had enough of this, Mark. She hung up and he closed his eyes for a second. This case was spiralling and he didn't know where. Enough of drifting. He was in a whirlpool now, spinning round and round and going places he didn't want to. He'd have to speak to Joanne next and report all this to Angelo. The phone rang again. He looked at it. Kelly. He picked up. Will you be here tonight? She asked. No preamble. Yep, later on. Can you pick up the kids from Mum's? I'm going out. Who with? He hated the way he sounded. Churlish. People from work. Have fun. Hardly. We lost the fucking case yesterday. Her voice was cold, dismissive. Oh, I'm sorry, Kelly. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's sorry. We're all sorry. That's why we're going to drown ourselves in drink. Okay. See you later, then. She hung up without saying goodbye. The second woman in two minutes to do so. And he turned on the indicator again, pulled out onto the road. Really, he thought, it was no use even paying attention to road rules in places like this. He could do all sorts of things here, and no one would know. There wouldn't be a soul who would come back thirty years later and say, Look here, I know what you did. Chapter 33 Friesland, 1994 Ingrid stepped into a room filled with books and flowers. The contrast with the drab exterior had a blinding effect, made her blink like a prisoner out of solitary. The man Ingrid had followed was standing by a fireplace, talking with an older woman in an orange dress, her grey hair swept up in a bun and pinned together with a shiny brooch. My mother, Julia, the man said, gesturing towards the other woman. Who are you? Julia said, her clipped English perhaps better than her son's. My name is Ingrid Alice Mathers. 
I have the same initials as your daughter. That makes you an expert? Her initials are kind of what got me started on all this. Us having the same. The IAM. It, well, go on. I think I may know what happened to her. May, no? Yulia arched her eyebrows and looked sideways at her son. The son picked up a snow globe and shook it. Bits of white flakes scattered and fell over a little boy and girl holding hands. We have many people coming here who tell us they may know what happened to my sister. Psychics, mainly. Are you a psychic? Yulia turned to her, blue eyes narrowed hard. No. Remember the last one? Her son turned to the woman. She told us that Anne was in South America, living in a cult. I remember. And then there was the man with the photos. The son studied the snow globe closely. He said he had evidence of Anne living as a sex slave in Romania. Ingrid cut in. I don't want to... The man ignored her. He wanted 10,000 guilders for the photos. Murder and I did not believe him, of course. We called the policeman and he was escorted out of town. That's terrible. That's... The man put the snow globe down carefully. He pulled his hands through his hair and looked out the window. My father, however, did believe him. He was always believing them. He gave this man the money and received in return an envelope with photos of Filipino children in a cage. His mother clasped her hands together and he walked across to her, standing behind the back of her chair. Just leave, he said, more tired than annoyed. If you are a psychic, leave. If you are a con woman, leave. If you are a journalist, leave immediately. We are done with people like you. Ingrid turned to go. There was nothing here, she thought. All resolve and her half-baked ideas seemed amateur and childish. She pushed a lock of hair behind her ears. Goodbye, she said. I'm sorry for bothering you. But the older woman spoke. You should wear it loose, she said, touching her own grey locks. You have very pretty hair. Ingrid reached up to her ponytail, felt the length of it. It's too messy, she said. It just blows about all the time. I should shave it off. Girls are always trying to hide their hair. Why? I never did. Ingrid stood, her eye on the sun, not sure what to do. She gave a small shrug. How old are you? Yulia spoke more kindly now. You look very young. I'm almost twenty-four. One year younger than Sander here. Such babies still. Sander gave a long sigh. Mama, she has to go. His mother ignored him. What did you want to tell us? You don't look like a psychic. Not enough cheap silver. And you've pretty hair instead of ugly purple dye. I think I know what happened to Isa. There was a moment's silence. You really do think you know, the son said. Yes. Well, tell us then. I'm curious now. Yulia settled back in her chair. Sander shook his head and leant against a bookshelf, refusing to look anywhere near Ingrid. Tell us then, the woman repeated. And tell it properly. Don't leave anything out. We've already imagined the very worst. She told them. She told them properly. She left nothing out. Chapter 34 Back home, Mark poured himself a whiskey and took it out onto the porch. His son's asleep after sausages, a bath, and some half-hearted bedside reading. He scrolled through his phone and thought about his past, the days in Coppers Christi, the residential college for police and training, and the heavy nights drinking out on the town. Always out on the town. On the prowl. On the pull. On the booze. 
on the grog. On something. Never with. His best mate at the time, Richo, had a way with women, constantly in between breaking up with girlfriends and finding a new one. Mark sometimes said that he ended up with Richo's leftovers, women who didn't quite make the grade of his mate's lofty standards. But what was that sort of thinking? Mark pondered now. All that talk of leftovers and making the grade and the meat market, it made him ill to think of his sons in ten years. And worse, a deep struggle to remember. Other things. A video late at night with a group of blokes. Them watching it. Watching Richo having it off with some girl he'd met at a pub. Who was that girl? None of them bothered to consider or ask if she'd consented to being filmed. There at Richo's house, in the dim light with the blue of the television flickering and their stomachs full of booze and a dark connection that spoke of something between sex and violence. None had questioned why Richo videoed himself having sex with some girl, and none questioned themselves watching. Always the watching, and never the doing. But did the doing spring from the watching? Always on, and never with. He tried to remember pushing Ingrid. Couldn't recall it. There were arguments at times. Youthful tears, snot and yelling. But pushing? He wasn't the sort. A push takes force, and he wasn't forceful. Ingrid was lying. She must be lying, about all manner of things. Had he used force? The thought wavered, wouldn't go away. He sipped his whiskey and looked out into the night. A car drove slowly past his house, the engine a mellow hum. Mark could make out a figure bent over the wheel. Head stretched forward as if straining to see. And what was there to see? At this time of the night, not much. A quiet street, respectable gardens with polite letterboxes out the front. Small facades hiding wealth, the renovations, the decks, the double glass doors. All secrets lay within, not out front. The car did a U-turn, drove past again, almost at walking pace the driver still bent like a magician's fork. Mark finished his drink, chucked the ice over the porch into the garden. He could have thrown it at the car if he'd wanted to. When he was thirteen, he used to do such things. It was fun, throwing things at random, just to see what would come next. He stood up, bent over the porch railings, and watched the taillights of the car blink as the car turned onto the main road. The person must have been lost. False directions. Faulty reading of the map. A thought niggled at the back of his mind and stayed there. He'd missed something, but it was just there. A realisation away. He tested the back of his mind again. Tried to clear the fog. Tried to see the faint lights. Nothing. They faded into the night. He'd already had the call from Jag Deep, who had phoned Joanne in Sydney. Nothing to report there, either. Hazy on dates, vague on details, Jagdeep thought Joanne a snob who was hiding something. When Jagdeep had said that the investigation into a historic crime involves examination of prior times and dates, Joanne had said, You mean an historic crime? What a bitch. Jagdeep railed down the phone to Mark. I'd hate to have been in your social group of friends at school. Joanne told Jagdeep that she had no recollection of Ingrid staying with her at the roadhouse on New Year's Eve. They'd been travelling together for a while, and before that, they were always at school together. After a while, most nights merge into one, Joanne told her, and Jagdeep admitted she had to agree. But missing out on a party on New Year's Eve when you're 18? Would that disappointment have blurred as easily? Jagdeep had doubts. Of course it didn't mean anything significant yet. The two women, however, would need to explain further. He looked at his empty whiskey glass, poured another, dark brown like solid earth. All nights did seem to blur into one. His past was like a squeeze box, pulled out the length of a beat, then collapsed into a single tune. In truth, the golden years were beginning to fade. All that nostalgia was probably based on photographs and not actual memory. 
He looked at his phone. Kelly still hadn't called. He stood and jumped up and down on the spot. That niggle. He couldn't shake it. If only he was smarter, more alert, more on the ball. More like Joanne. The thought came to him in a rush. Joanne was always the smart one, quick planning and calm. She would have made an excellent cop. A memory. Joanne in maths, year 10. The teacher had written a complex problem on the board and was waiting for them to answer it. Joanne, meanwhile, was looking bored, tapping her fingers onto the wooden desk she shared with Mark. The teacher told her off. Are you going to do any work or just sit there daydreaming? I don't daydream, she said coldly, and your answer is 43. The teacher was taken aback, and Mark, sitting beside her, felt the chill. The phone rang. Jag deep again. He took his glass of whiskey and walked inside. Yes, he said. What's up? Her voice was scratchy over the phone. Mark asked her to repeat herself, asked her how she was, but she cut him off. Her customary bluntness always a jolt. They found something. The analysts, she said. He waited, a heaviness in his gut. He knew she was referring to the search of the site where Michael Denby was found dead. A new development. Her voice was cutting in and out, so Mark had to step inside his bedroom, shut the door, and cup the phone to his ear. Jagdeep kept talking. A go. Analyst says, new, no ID. The press will need to be... Slow down, he said. I can't hear you properly. Sorry, it's my phone. Been playing up. Her voice now suddenly calm and clear. Look, there's been a development. Hush, hush till it's official. You're going to need to go and pick up the report from forensics. What did they find? He'd missed it when she said it the first time. Human bone fragments recovered from the site, possibly from the forearm. He waited, hearing the dread in Jagdeep's voice. The bones are not Denby's, Mark. They're from someone else. Mark was silent. His colleague spoke again, her words punching the air. Can you hear me? He could. He could hear her just fine. Chapter 35. Friesland. 1994. After Ingrid left the Modderman's little house, she went back to her dorm room and lay on her bed. She imagined herself a prisoner in the Tower of London, in some dank cell with coldness seeping through the walls. She could picture it. The footsteps up the stairs, the rapping on the door, the jostling of men, the manacles, the fear, the shame... She huddled up in her sleeping bag and looked out the window to the flat fields beyond, the yellow of the daffodils dazzling against a grey sky. She missed home. Her childhood home, that was. The dry country town with its wide, slow river and drooping gums. She'd never swim in the North European rivers, with their dark silver currents deadly as a knife. Before she left the house, the older woman turned away from her without speaking. The space between her feet and the woman expanded. She may as well have been on a distant hemisphere. Sander stood, head bowed for a long moment before he walked over to her, took her by the elbow and escorted her out, as if she was too unseemly to be present in their company. As she stepped out the door, he asked her in a quiet voice where she was staying and what her plans were. Because, well, they would need to know. Ingrid told him. The next morning she was headed back to Amsterdam, to the Hans Brinker Hostel, where she'd try to get some work to raise money for the trip home. There was some work on reception there, she added, her voice trailing off then gaining strength. She would stay four weeks at most, so if anyone needed to see her there or ask questions or whatever, that was where she'd be. But lying on the top bunk, looking at the fields growing darker and the yellow ever more brilliant, Ingrid only wanted to go home. Preferably back in time, too, to when she was a kid leaping off rope swings and riding her bike. Before she closed her eyes to sleep, ears open to the sound of thudding feet, she thought of the sleek grey body of the shark, how flexible and quick it had been. On another day, she might have mistaken it for a dolphin riding the waves. That was the thing, Ingrid thought. 
You never knew what someone or something was till it looked you in the eye, till it declared, Look at me. This is what I am. Make no mistake. The next morning, Ingrid travelled back to Amsterdam and signed up to work at the hostel. As backpacker places went, it wasn't bad. She'd been in ones where going to the bathroom on a Sunday meant an evil game of dodge the spew. There was no jelly fighting like there was in the Cairns backpackers, and for that she was glad. Jelly was terrible to clean up. She was still waiting for the knock at the door, still ready to stand and say, yes, that's me. But one day passed, two days, and nothing happened. On the third day, she was trying to explain to an Australian couple how best to get to the Anne Frank Museum, when Mika, the woman she'd first been to see, entered reception. As she shook down her coat and looked about her with cool interest, the Australian couple shrank as if before greatness. That's the thing about Australians, Ingrid thought. We like to believe that we're egalitarian, but really, we're still enthralled to the bigwig. Can I help you? Ingrid asked. Mika flicked her hand towards the couple in a gesture for them to finish their business, but they backed off at speed. Ingrid half thought they would salute. Mika looked around her to the posters advertising pub crawls, African safaris, share houses, cheap tickets to Lima, and a handwritten sign. Jez, when you get here, come find me. I'll be in the bar or sleeping. Sir Raz. Who is Sir Raz? Mika asked with genuine interest. Ingrid shook her head. I'm not sure. Would you say he is a Cory? I don't think you'll find him at Rembrandt House. Mika sat down on the chair opposite Ingrid's desk and crossed her legs. This is it, Ingrid thought. The door will now burst open and there will be television cameras at the window. Sander called me. He told me about your visit. Ingrid looked hard at the Sir Raz sign. You could find anyone if you wanted, she thought. Sir Raz would be found. I came to see if you would like a job, Mika said, noting Ingrid's start. This Cory project is taking up all my time, and I wondered if you would work through the papers for me. Submissions, ideas, some translation. It's really just filing, but I do need help, and you sound as if you need the work. I'm only planning on being here three or four weeks, till I get enough to go home, Ingrid said. Well? Mika tapped the desk twice. Now you can do it in two. I'll pay you the proper rate, and I doubt you're receiving that here. It was true. The amount she was earning barely covered food and board. Why are you helping me? Anne, or Isa as you call her, was my good friend. I like her family. I'm in a position to help you, and so I will. So it happened that three days a week, Ingrid went to Mika's house to work. It calmed her the walk from the hostel to the house by the Silver Grey Canal. The streets became familiar, and after the backpackers, Ingrid found that she enjoyed the quiet of Mika's place. The coffee in small cups, speculas, the rustling of papers and files. On the second week, Sander showed up at Mika's house towards the end of Ingrid's shift and offered to walk her back to the hostel. He was sorry, he said, about the way she was treated at his family home. It was just the shock, he explained. As they strolled, Ingrid hesitant, Sander talked no more about her visit and what she had revealed. Instead, he spoke about the city, about his share house, about the game of Fierleppen, or canal jumping, he used to play as a boy. Walking and listening, Ingrid felt a loosening, as if somewhere inside her, extra string was being released from a spool. It was pleasant listening to him talk, and when he said he'd see her the next day, she didn't object. Two weeks longer in Amsterdam turned into three, and it began to seem normal that, besides the walk, they'd also stop for a drink and something to eat. Mika asked if she'd like to stay on for another month, and Ingrid agreed. When one night Sander kissed her as they said goodbye, it seemed only natural that he should stay in her room at the hostel. And then the night after that, she at his. In those days, she felt that she could already see the trajectory of how it would go, the gentle rise and fall, 
the kind gestures after lust. And always beneath, always the Sturm und Drang, the turbulence of life. But at that time, in those days when she worked with Mika and walked with Sander, Ingrid focused mainly on the forgiving embrace of people from another land. And when one day, eight weeks after they'd first met, she received a notification that her work visa was overdue and told Sander she'd have to go home, he suggested she get sponsored by Mika to try to stay. They asked Mika. She agreed. Ingrid and Sander moved in together, a small apartment near the red light district. They were happy, she remembered. Fixated. But after a few years, she found that she missed the wide open spaces, the big skies of Australia. She began to remember why she'd come to the Netherlands in the first place. All the things she still had to do. Occasionally, she thought of the eye of the shark, a predator she strove to be free from. So when, after almost five years in Holland, she asked Sander to come home with her, she felt an immense relief that his answer was yes. Chapter 36 Mark woke to the sound of Kelly vomiting in the front yard. At first he thought it was some wild animal howling in the wind, and then he recognised the familiar anguished tone of the drunk in a fallen state. As he stumbled about in the dark, finding the lights and making his way to her, Mark noted the time, 2.45am, and the veracity of the spew. It told of a night of hard drinking, most likely brown spirits, probably dancing, maybe a smoke or two. When he opened the front door, Kelly was on her knees, half crying in between the doleful swallow and purge. He did the right things, held her hair away from her face, rubbed her back, and when she was finished, helped her inside. She limped beside him like a puppet, lifting her arms up so he could remove her shirt, then dropping them hard at her sides. Fucking fuckheads, she dribbled. Loy's so crap. And listening to her, he had to agree. When he laid her on the bed, she pulled him to her and whispered hot in his ear, Next Tuesday. And even as he recoiled from her vomit breath, he felt a kind of longing for the following week. What was next Tuesday? Not their anniversary. He pondered for a second while she crawled into a ball and continued moaning about the state of the law. Not her birthday, or one of the boys. Not his. Kelly lay on the bed in her undies and bra, her blue socks wrinkled and her face a sea of snot and tears. She reminded him suddenly of a young girl, and he covered her up with the doona, placed a bucket beside her head. How easy it would be for someone to take advantage of her, he thought. And for the first time, rightly or wrongly, he was glad he had no daughters. It was 3.30am. No rest for the wicked. He couldn't sleep in the room with his wife, not with her vomit breath and the low moaning of a person on the brink of a hangover sent straight from hell. He pulled a blanket out of the cupboard and took himself into the lounge room, where he settled on the couch and listened to the sounds of his house. Next Tuesday, he thought before drifting off to sleep. Surely by next Tuesday, the world would appear less haphazard and all within it would be methodical and calm. Daylight hours brought no relief for his wife. When he poked his head in to see her before he went to work, she lay in a sea of agony, white-faced and sombre. Oh, what happened? She asked him. I can't even remember getting home. You're off your face. And what's next Tuesday? Kelly, holding a bag of frozen peas to her forehead, looked confused. Tuesday? In the room down the corridor, Mark could hear one son beginning to wake. I gotta go, he said to his wife. You'll forgive me for not kissing you goodbye. Kelly looked at him with a blank face and laid her head down on the pillow. See you later, Mark said, and a limp hand rose from somewhere beneath the covers to give him a farewell. On the way to the forensics office in central Adelaide, Mark rang Angelo. His boss had already heard from Jag Deep about the video with Ingrid and Joanne and was keen for further questioning. Angelo knew, too, about the search of the site and the meeting Mark was about to attend. 
Jesus, Angelo, Mark said. What am I here for? You're my eyes and ears, Angelo said. While you're off hobnobbing with the elite? Exactly. Hobnobbing is what I do. Angelo asked him if he'd heard. Suzanne Miller was out of a job. The channel she worked for had given her the flick for a younger presenter, someone who was more relatable to the young folk of today. When you say young folk, you sound as if you're 90, Mark said. I feel it. Mark thought about Suzanne Miller with her flowing curls and megawatt smile. Surely kids couldn't care less about who presented fun with shapes, as long as it was someone who could dance and look as if they were having fun. It was more likely the executives of the station had given her the heave-ho because of her age. Younger women with fewer lines, firmer chests, lower wage brackets, and on the brink of their careers, they were the ones the big wigs wanted. Those more likely to say, yes please, instead of piss off. Poor Suzanne, he thought, scrambling for some media attention by dredging up the past. Surely now, all the future held was a half-decent podcast and an invitation to, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. She'd be eating the ass out of an armadillo in less time than it took to say triangle. What about Suzanne's husband? He asked. How did he do in his lobbying? Too early to tell. Well, we won't be hearing from Suzanne again then. Probably not, but she got the ball rolling on this whole investigation. She's the reason we're all in this mess. Some mess you're in, Mark thought. You and your Mercedes Benz. <clears throat> Talking about mess. Angelo cleared his throat. Mark waited. You may find in forensics today there's a little awkwardness. Couldn't be helped. Mark felt his stomach drop to his knees. Forensics. He should have known. Anyway, Angelo continued. Be needing a full report in the next week. Send everything you've got, every minute detail, every time you or someone you met pick their jocks out of their ass. Then we can move on to other, more important matters. Like funding allocations for the force after the election? Mark guessed that was what Angelo had been working on. All the fancy dinners, the politicians, the background knowledge on Eric Vela. Exactly. Mark turned into the forensics parking lot and switched off the engine. He told himself that 50 was the new 30, that he was in a good place, that the past is the past is the past. He patted down his hair and entered the glass doors, and two officers were waiting to meet him. One, a younger male he didn't recognise, the other... A female, he did. Acting Inspector Margariti, she said, shaking her head. You again. Detective Senior Sergeant Jane Southern, he replied, reaching to shake both their hands. Me again. Jane, he noted, looked the same on first glance. The short, dark hair, the tall, lean build, the fitted suit and low heels. But as she and her partner filled him in on the way to the lab on the procedures they'd followed... The trip taken by the SA experts to the location of Denby's death and the papers, which would now need to be filed, he saw that she looked tired. Drained, even. There were dark circles under her eyes and she'd lost weight, if that was even possible. He was used to seeing her wearing red lipstick, but today she seemed subdued. In the lab, the two detectives showed him the microscope and he peered in and saw a confusing array of lines and dots. That means nothing to me, he said, surfacing. I don't even know if I'm looking at something in my eyelid. The male officer, whose name escaped Mark, began to explain before Jane cut in. All you need to know is that we found evidence of blood from the deceased and possibly some hair fragments which match Denby's DNA. But we also found something else. Here she paused, and Mark waited. The analysts found bone fragments too, and not Denby's. Mark widened his eyes, aiming for surprise. He saw Jane look at him and narrow hers. The expert continued. That in itself is interesting enough, but our essay analysts, and this is why it took them some time to disclose the fact, believe that the bones have been lying there for some time. A decade or so before Denby's death, in fact. Mark felt a slight rise of panic in his chest though he hardly knew why. A decade before Denby. He saw Jane still watching him closely, and he took a breath. Do we know anything about the bone? Possibly finger, forearm matches. And female. Probably young. 
Beyond that, we won't know much more till we get some DNA matches from the NAT database. Missing persons, etc., etc. That could take a while. Mark made a note to ask Angelo to get them to speed up the results. The male officer handed him their report. The press have already got hold of most of this information already. He said, some journo from up north was sniffing around the search site, asking questions. Mark thought of the dogged Hugh from the Port York advertiser, snooping around, a growing excitement. Weapons of mass destruction? Not quite, but a bomb of sorts. The forensic report was complex, and he stood for a few minutes, trying to decipher the codes and medical terms. At the bottom of the page, neatly typed, Site search and analysis revealed older evidence linked to an individual other than Denby. Fragments of bone found one to seven centimetres apart, possibly finger phalanges and radial. Female, age not yet ascertained, likely late teen. DNA samples revealed traces of blood in a radius of one metre. No spatter formation. Mark signed the necessary form to state he'd received the report from the lab and put all the papers in an A4 envelope Jane handed him. Outside, the city was sharp, with thin rays of sunshine, and office windows gave off harsh, glinted light. After making small talk, football, the election, Angelo's ascent, the younger officer said his goodbyes and turned back inside. Mark looked at Jane. Coffee? Jane hesitated for a second before giving a brief nod, and together they walked to a place a couple of doors up from the lab, decided on a table and sat down. I never know whether to sit at a table or at one of those bench things by the window, Mark said. He looked at a group of businessmen, hesitating with the choice. It's a real problem. Tell me, where does the United Nations sit on that issue? Jane asked, and they both smiled. It was a surprise seeing you here today, Mark said. I was warned, Jane replied, and I wasn't too happy. But then I thought, well... We can't go on ignoring one another forever. I was surprised you left fraud so soon after I went on leave. Really? Why would I stay? Jane glanced out the window. It was only ever temporary, and without you it wasn't too pleasant. What, with all the talk? And she added, I don't like being called a cougar. You got called that? Jesus. She was hardly much older than him. What did you get called? A toy boy, I suppose. Me? I got called a lucky bastard. Immediately, Mark felt his face grow hot. He shouldn't have said it, but it was true. Of all the gossip after the affair, that was the phrase that most stuck. All the overweight married cops in fraud coveting their super and planning the next cruise. Jane Southern may as well have been a mirage. When they told him he was a lucky bastard, they said it half in sadness and half in wonder. The yearning. The loss. Men don't change much from adolescence. His female colleagues hadn't been so admiring of the affair. Kelly, though they barely knew her, was first and foremost in their minds. The photograph of her on his desk eyed the women in his office sadly, and they answered that look. Women stick together. It's a good thing, but he shouldn't have told Jane just now that he had been called lucky. Mark focused hard on his menu then ordered a flat white from a waiter with a stupid moustache thing on his chin. Are you still with Kelly? Jane asked. Yes, we're working things out. We're trying. That's good. There was a moment of silence. You work things out with Rod? Jane smoothed the table with her hand. Rod left me. I'm so sorry, Jane. He was sorry. It didn't seem fair that she was now alone when Kelly had stayed with him. He remembered reading an article that stated it took, on average, two years for a man to find a new partner after their old one had died. For women, it was an average of five years, or never. Men really were assholes. His eyes followed the waiter and his chin moustache thing. Dickheads, too. Why would a bloke leave someone like Jane? For a brief affair? Give me a break. It's hardly a hanging offence. Suddenly, he felt very tired. Moustache presented them with their coffees, telling them to enjoy, guys.
Jane took a sip of hers and looked at her watch. Listen, she said. There was something else the analyst told me. Unofficially, of course. Mark believed it. Men told Jane things. He had told her things. Things that made him blush when he recalled them now. He drank his coffee. He listened. Tilted his head closer to her. The analyst told me his initial thoughts were that we should spread the search wider. Go out. Look for other evidence. Why would he say that? Because Jane leant in over the table, her perfume a woody mix of flowers and bark. He found another piece of bone. Not official yet. Too early to tell if it was from the same woman as the other fragments. But he has his suspicions. Go wider, he said. Two different bone specimens. The females from a decade earlier... And now one more? Mark closed his eyes. Suzanne Miller could not have possibly known what she had uncovered. Lockhart's exchange principle. The theory held tight. Offered possibilities and dread. Belangelo, Malat, Wolf Creek. All the old fears came back. Jane finished the rest of her coffee and stood. I'm not sure we'll be seeing each other again, Mark. Or should I say, acting inspector? But good luck with everything. We may need to talk further on the bones when the new findings come out. Jane took a lipstick out of her pocket, applied it quickly and without fuss. You know where to find me, she said. Chapter 37 1999 When they landed in Australia after almost five years in Amsterdam and in time for Christmas... Ingrid felt the hot slap of a dry wind that told her she was back. Adelaide was in the midst of a heat wave. Five consecutive days of temperatures over 40 and boiling nights which made for fevered dreams. They spent the first few days in Ingrid's hometown of Baralama, where Sander swam in the Brown River, hurled himself off rope swings and drank icy beer with overweight uncles. His pale European face stained a blotchy red on the second day and his lips peeled and blistered. Jet-lagged, thirsty, and covered in flies, Sander could be forgiven for hating the joint. But as he sat with her father eating a sausage and white bread and drinking another VB, Ingrid could see that he wasn't hating it at all. On the contrary, Sander seemed to thrive with a nervous energy undetectable to Ingrid in the Netherlands. One stifling night, coming to bed after rabbit or roo shooting with Uncle Frank, he wondered in a drunken voice at how friendly and open Australians were. This had surprised him, he said. He was brought up to believe differently. Thought Australians were largely incompetent, lazy and reluctant to admit error. But that was just the police force back then, Ingrid said, wiping his hair from his sweaty forehead as he lay beside her. We're not all like that. He was quiet. Frank told me that you were a good shot. It was true. Growing up, she used to be a dab hand with a twenty two calibre rifle. Tin cans and rabbits, mostly. I was okay. Ingrid remembered standing on the back of the ute at night, headlights on, searching for ruse. As a kid, she loved the speed, the weight of the twenty two, the thrill of the hunt. Now, the memory filled her with a deep distaste. The following week, Ingrid and Sander hired a car and drove along the southeast coast, all along the winding roads beside the lagoons and the wild ocean. One night, a storm threatened, and they huddled close in their tent, watching lightning sear the sky above a choppy sea. On the fourth day, they reached the little town of Bray Inlet, near Warnbean, and rented a cabin in the caravan park across the road from the beach. Ingrid showed him newspaper clippings and notes she'd made, the one she'd kept at her family home all this time. Sander flicked through them, distracted and vague. He didn't know she'd done all this research. When Ingrid said that she wouldn't mind living in a place such as Bray Inlet, he became angry and questioned her motives. She yelled, he yelled, and in a move that shocked them both, Sander threw a wine glass hard against the wall, smashing it. A small shard flew out, cutting Ingrid on the foot, Red wine ran down white paint and Ingrid stood startled, looking at the blood welling near her little toe. 
It seemed to her to be from a different foot, not hers. Sander sat with his hands wrapped around his head, murmuring apologies. Ingrid did not say a thing. She swept up the broken glass. She sponged the blood away from the floor and wiped the walls. She placed a plaster neatly over the cut. In time, the small wound left a scar, but of their fight, that was the only trace. Sander went for a walk on the beach and came back to find her lying on the bed. He lay beside her, wrapped his big arms around her body and told her he was finally ready to travel north. On the way to that place, desolation etched in the Dutchman's face. Ingrid drove while Sander stared out the window at the wide brown land. When he asked to stop and get out, she remained in the car, watching him while he paced with head turned to the ground and hands gripped together like a priest reading the last rites. At the roadhouse, Ingrid let Sander go in to pay for the petrol. It wasn't an old man serving, he said. It was a young man, shiny like a Christmas decoration. According to the shiny guy, an old man did still own the place. Coke bottle glasses and grossly overweight. Not a good boss. Up the Stuart they drove, and Ingrid stopped where she thought she should stop, and they both got out and wandered around the scrub. They didn't speak. After a short while they found a stunted tree and Sander bent down, reading the bark on it, looking for signs. He rested his cheek on the tree for a long time. Ingrid didn't go close, kept her hand over her mouth, willing herself not to be sick. Difficult to know if it was the right tree, but the landscape overwhelmed, made her heart thump and head ache. After that, Ingrid decided she didn't want to go any further, so Sander dropped her at the roadhouse where she caught a bus to Adelaide, and then another to the small town in the southeast of the state. She took her clippings and her notes and her research with her. I A M, she thought, her old inspiration, her spur but it was harder now that other people were involved. I A M. That mentality. It's a solitary pursuit. Only you can save yourself from the shark. It's hard to rescue others or help others or lift them up on your raft. Sometimes it's best you don't. Sander kept driving, first to Cutter's End where he spent New Year's Eve 1999. There was a party at the underground hotel where he stayed and he joined two friendly Croatians at the bar for an hour or so. They suggested he travel up to Alice Springs and Uluru with them, but he said maybe another time. Instead, he drove back down the highway and stopped to look once more at the little tree. Such a small tree, he thought, minute against the enormous sky and the distant horizon. He thought perhaps it would be the opposite, but the tree made Sanda love Ingrid all the more, and he drove all the way down to the small town where she was and asked her to marry him and forget about it all. On one condition. He would live in Australia, but Adelaide first, not in Bray, at least for a few years. They needed to get on with their lives. In hindsight, it was a simple thing to ask. Chapter 38 Back at home, Mark read the paper online. Outback investigation widens. Bone fragments have been found on the site of investigation into the January 1990 death of Michael Denby, the man who saved the life of a young Suzanne Miller. Following findings, a spokeswoman for South Australian Police said, Although it is too early to say precisely how old these fragments are, initial forensic investigations suggest they are not recent and are likely to be up to a decade older than any remains of Michael Denby. Specialists are being deployed to recover and examine them. We'd ask people not to speculate online about the nature of the bones while this process is underway. Such actions could jeopardise the investigation and any future court case. Nearby roadhouse owner Kay Forster said that since police arrived, there had been a lot of activity. They are searching the land just up from here, and we've been told that human remains have been found, she said. It's very concerning. This is such a peaceful place. We've never had any trouble here at all. Mark turned off his iPad, cleared the table, 
picked up the recycling and took it to the bin outside, wheeled it to the front of the curb. Life goes on, and bin night cannot be ignored. A neighbour walked past, and he stopped for a chat, stooping to pat the man's little dog. Is Kelly all right? The neighbour asked. Haven't seen her out walking for a while. Mark looked at the man, whose name he could barely recall. All these observant people, he thought. They should have been cops. Again, that feeling he was on the outside of things, looking in. Kelly's fine, he said. Just a bit snowed under with work. The neighbour looked at him closely. Yes, that must be it, he said, and kept walking. Back in the house, Mark went into the study and paused in the doorway, watching his wife. Kelly was bent over a laptop, typing hard. She jumped when Mark asked her if she wanted a coffee, and then shook her head. I'm contacting people about the case, she said. We've got to work quickly if we've any hope of an appeal. But isn't it all over? You need a break from it, Kel. She turned to him, suddenly furious. You think it's over? She grabbed the photo from her desk, the one of the woman with her face punched in. You think this is over for her? She pointed at the woman. God, Mark, you seriously don't get it, do you? He stepped back. It was as if she had slapped him. Do something, she may as well have said. Fuck off, she meant. He backed out, went to close the door as she spoke again, sniffing. Someone from your school rang. A Maria somebody. She wanted to know if you're going to the reunion. It's next weekend. You should have replied by now. Mark closed the door of the study and left her to murder the keyboard while he sat with the two boys on the couch. Kelly was speaking on the phone to someone, voice raised, angry. I asked you not to send that, she was saying. I specifically asked you not to, Robin. A thought came to Mark. The images of Lynette Denby, face smashed, eye flooded in red. He thought of Darrell, recalling what his old colleague in Cutter's End had said, that there was a malat in every town, if you looked hard enough. He pictured the old cop in the dingy station, researching the disappearances of the sisters, of the Dutch girl, Isa or Anne, going over the evidence again and again. Those other names too, Donna Arlington, Carly North. That was police work. The rereading, the files, the going over. He removed his arm from around one of his sons and collected from the bottom of his suitcase the manila folder Daryl had given him. A malat in every town. Moving rooms, he settled himself on his bed, door open so he could see the boys. He opened the file. The papers, most of them familiar, fell out. The article about the two missing sisters, the photo of them, some accompanying notes. He looked over them again. Nothing new. But still... Something ticked over in his mind. Of the two photos in their file, there was one with the sisters smiling broadly into the camera, backpacks on and standing in front of a brick facade. Their home in Warnbean, most likely. He studied the photo closely. Nothing came to mind, but still. He flicked to the second one, the image that accompanied the newspaper report he'd read. In this one, the girls leant against the side of a vehicle, arms folded and feet crossed. The younger of the two, or older, in her blue outfit, peered slightly to the left of the camera, mouth half open, as if she was in the middle of a conversation. This case, he thought. It was about images and stills of videos and photos. He recalled Sandra on the wall of the backpackers, Michael Denby's beaten wife, Ingrid, and Joanne in the roadhouse donger, Michael Denby's twisted and burnt frame at the bottom of his vehicle. But what was he looking at here, exactly? He peered at the sisters, Raylene and Adele Cunningham, in the photo. Mark put the images down and read the article again, the descriptions of them being well-liked, the townsfolk worried, and so on. He turned to the photo once more, held it up to his eyes, and, with a jolt of recognition, saw what it was. Tiny and half-hidden by Raylene, an image of a leaf-shaped flower on the vehicle's frame. The Sturt Desert P. He'd seen the sticker before on a vehicle just like this one. He'd seen it. The vehicle the sisters lent on was the same one he'd seen on the backpacker's wall and on Phoebe's phone. 
the Land Cruiser, that belonged to John Baber, husband of the local doctor and the man who discovered the broken body of Michael Denby. Mark reeled. Doubles, he remembered. John Baber was a man who enjoyed reading about duality, two sides of the same person. The thought made Mark uneasy. Unable to keep still, he stood and walked around the room. John Baber's reputation was impeccable around town. The barman from the Opal Inn had said so. He checked the time. The pub would be open. Googling the number and then dialing, Mark watched the boys while he waited, unsure exactly of what he should ask. Hello there. A woman's voice, friendly and warm. The Dolly Parton look-alike. He tried to focus on that and not the image of her on the bed that Phoebe had thrust in his face. Hi, Mark said, Acting Inspector Ariti here. The policeman from Adelaide who ate at your... Oh, I remember you. She broke in, voice warm. When are you coming back to town, love? He chatted for a while and then asked her about John Baber. John, she said. We couldn't do without him. Anything we need, he's on his way to Port York. He's coming around here fixing things, the sort that would do anything for you. Reliable as clockwork. Mark held the phone a little distance from his ear. Gandhi wouldn't get a better recommendation, he thought. Back in the day, John was the type to pick up hitchhikers, give people lifts on his way back and forth to town. I'll always love. He was always giving lifts to people. Anyone who needed one. He used to give them to me on occasion. Big heart, our John. Big heart. And seriously, you can set your watch by him. Mark said his goodbyes, promised to visit once more, and yes, he'd bring his family, and yes, he'd make sure to make himself known. He put the phone down. Thought about John in his house, the violence in the books he liked, the stillness of the room, the dark. He called Jagdeep, left a message for her on what he'd found. Chapter 39 Days later, at his mother's house in Baralama, there for the 32-year reunion, rose bushes lent in, their heavy, wet scent taking Mark back to his youth. This house, this old weatherboard with drooping verandas, big windows and a luscious garden, brought him back. In the oak tree out the front, he and his father had made a treehouse with a rope attached to it, dangling below for his mother to put food in baskets for him to haul up. Once, he lifted his baby cousin in the bassinet up, up all the way to the wooden structure in the leaves, and then lowered him back down, down, down. It made him smile to think of it now. No thought of consequences when you're young. He resolved to finish the treehouse he'd promised Charlie and Sam. He called out hello, and his mother hurried out from the side, pulling her gardening gloves off and holding her arms wide. Darling, she said, you're home. In his mother's warm embrace, he felt the shyness of a man who knows he's loved despite all his failings. He hugged her back, lifting her off her feet, making her exclaim, because this is what mothers love about their boys, the strength, the vulnerability. He stepped back from her, looking into her face. Helen had aged in the few months since he'd seen her last. New wrinkles lined her face, and her bones felt sharp on her small frame. You've put on a little weight, Marcus, she said to him, tapping his stomach, and he rolled his eyes. Always the weight. What happened to small talk about the weather? It's good to be back, Mum. Come on in, she said. I've made Anzacs. He reminded her of his weight gain, which she'd only just pointed out, and she waved her hand in the air. So go for a run or do yoga or whatever it is you do nowadays. You're here with me, and I've been cooking. So she had. He went into the kitchen and saw a freshly made batch of Anzacs alongside a pile of vegetable cuttings and saucepans of water. Bunches of flowers perched on windowsills and tables and the tops of books, Photographs and artwork from grandchildren adorn the walls beside botanical paintings of grevilleas and snow gums and kangaroo grass. The place was a mess, but a happy one. I'm making lasagna with homegrown pumpkin, his mother said, and the sauce is all from my tomatoes. Sounds good, he said, but I'll be leaving around 7pm for the reunion. Plenty of time. We've practically got the whole day. His mother ducked down to a cupboard and wriggled about looking for something. I've got a... 
Here it is. She resurfaced, brandishing a bottle of gin. I knew I had it somewhere. We'll have a drink together before you go out. For sure, he said, feeling slightly ashamed by how obviously pleased she was to see him. He should visit more often, he thought. Bring Kelly and the kids. They loved Mum. Oh, and Kelly called, his mother was saying as she darted around the kitchen, scooping potato peel into a bowl. She's coming up with the boys. I'm so excited. She said she wasn't sure what she was doing this weekend, and I said, come up here and we'll make it a real party. I said if she doesn't want to go to the reunion, she can stay home with me. Or, if she does want to go, I can look after the boys. Either way, isn't it wonderful, Mark? It was. It was also a surprise to him. Kelly hadn't seemed too fast when he'd left for the weekend. And your sister should be calling soon on the Skype, his mother said. I told her you were up here so we can all have a talk. That's great, Mum. Mark hadn't spoken to Prue for at least three months. Again, that feeling of guilt. It rankled. He should be a better brother. He should be a better son. His mother continued clanging away in the kitchen while he took his bag into his old room. The moon and stars doona was gone, but still there was the single bed, the rickety bookcase, the fading stickers of Freddy Krueger and U2 on the chest of drawers. He tried calling Kelly. No response. During the week, he'd had a few jokey texts from old schoolmates. Looking forward to a few frothies. Be good to catch up. That type of thing. By all accounts, Ingrid and Joanne would be there. It was, Mark admitted, part of the reason he decided to attend the reunion. Having the two of them there together was an opportunity to ask a few pointed questions. His mother had told him a couple of days before that Joanne had flown down from Sydney, then hired a car to drive up to Baralama. Helen, usually so friendly, breathed dismissively down the phone. Joanne's parents, she said, were so religious. More so now than ever. Helen was so nervous she might say shit in front of them that she went the long way around the block just to avoid them. Mark had forgotten that part about Joanne, the religious upbringing. Perhaps it was the rituals, the restrictions, which made her seem so cool. Reminders of a burning apocalypse were surely one way to dampen high spirits. His mother was calling him. Mark left his bedroom and entered the chaos of the kitchen where Helen was shouting into the screen of a laptop. Here's Mark. Look, Mark, here's Prue and the kids. Say hi, Mark. Mark said hi. Prue waved back through a shaky screen. Helen continued. Look, Mark, Prue and the kids are having a pizza night. Mark sighed. He remembered Prue's pizza nights from when she lived in the Adelaide Hills. All fun and games till someone had to clean up. There was flour everywhere by the look of it. There's flour everywhere and you look so pale like that family from Flowers in the Attic. Helen was still shouting into the screen. Hello, little Eddie, Ben and Alex, Nana loves you. Prue waved back, trying to talk over Helen. It really was exhausting. Mark rested on the bench, head on elbow. How are you, Mark? Prue's face was suddenly clear on the screen. You home for the reunion? He said he was and gave a brief rundown of what the night promised. Party at the Northo. A bonfire at Jason Chris Ward's afterwards for those who wanted to kick on. His sister nodded, interested. He remembered how much she liked people. Prue was a few years older than him, knew all the people he mentioned. Plus, she was much more sociable than him, kept in contact with people from the town. Let them stay when they visited Vancouver. Helen left the room, saying she'd call Prue in a few days. I'll call you in a few days! In response, Prue held up Eddie's chubby little arm and together... They waved flowery hands. Who'll be there? Prue asked after Helen left. He told her. All the old friends, Ingrid and Joanne included. She listened in, asking questions, remembering funny little anecdotes about people they knew. He had a sudden thought. Did you know that Joanne had a baby while she was in America on exchange? Prue knotted her brow, shook her head. What? Who told you that? Mum. She heard it from, I don't know. On the screen, little Eddie started bawling and Prue shoved something in his mouth. Listen, she said, face close to the screen. That's bullshit, probably invented by Joanne's Jesus-loving parents. A lesser shame and all that. Who the fuck knows? Mark recoiled. What the hell was this? This had taken a turn. So what happened? He asked. 
Joanne didn't have a baby in America. She had an abortion. Worst thing ever for her parents and family. Ridiculous. I did not know that. Of course you didn't. The family kept it quiet, said that she'd had a little holiday, which was the euphemism in those days for having a baby out of wedlock. Mark thought about Joanne when he first saw her after her trip to America. Thinner, features sharper, cooler. I did not know. Well, that's not the main thing, his sister continued. Abortions are sad, but a lot of women have them. The main thing? Joanne was raped. During the last semester of her exchange, some asshole raped her at a party. Went to court and everything. Didn't you know any of this? Mark shook his head. He'd heard none of it. Prue brushed flour off her face. Don't feel bad you didn't know. I doubt many people did. It was all hush-hush. That's how they treated sexual assault in the good old days. That, or they still thought that if a woman stayed out of society for more than six months, it must have been that she got herself in trouble. I think Joanne's family pushed that line. Better than admitting to the town the abortion, the rape. How did you know? Dean Hooper, one of her cousins, told me. I used to go out with him, remember? He'd heard it from his father, who helped out with some legal stuff for Joanne. Well, shit. Yeah. The siblings chatted a little longer, easy with each other. They made vague promises to speak again soon, and then hung up, after Mark watched his nephews give fat little waves. It's funny, he pondered, thinking about Prue. How much we take siblings for granted. They're the most constant and longest relationships we have in our lives, yet we're so casual about it. Mark wandered out to the garden, where Helen was knee-deep in pruning, flinging rose branches behind her like a plough. He thought of telling her about Joanne and the assault, but decided against it. Instead, he rolled up his sleeves and, taking a rake, began moving the prunings into a pile. He raked, remembered how much he liked pottering about in the soil and leaves. It was pleasant there with his mother in the garden, the smell of dirt and roses, the sky falling into dark. They settled into an easy way of talking. You and Prue were funny kids, Helen was saying, like two peas in a pod. But the fighting, my word, your father and I had a hard time of it. Mark couldn't remember the fighting, or not much of it. <laughs> For a little boy, you had a toughness about you. <laughs> His mother laughed into the roses. <laughs> not afraid to give anyone a whack if it meant getting your own way. The image jarred and was in opposition to the childhood photos of himself on various walls inside, the angelic hair and toothy smile, the little boy holding up a flower. I remember Dad telling me never to hit a girl, Mark said. His father had told him that. Stern, his direction not to be messed with. Maybe Prue didn't count as a girl then, Helen said. You had a real temper on you when you were young. Mark watched as a wasp settled in the air beside him like a drone. He stood still. The wasp could attack or leave. It came closer, slowly, slowly, before flying backwards in a zigzag pattern, up in the air and away from sight. Was I violent to anyone else? He asked, and the garden seemed impossibly quiet. Helen put down her secateurs, looked at the pile of pruning like it was a shrine, and stood up. Not to my knowledge, she said, laying a gentle hand on his shoulder as she passed. Before he left to go to the reunion, he and Helen had a gin together on the porch. As they drank, his mother shared photos of him when he was in high school. Football teams, class photos, him on his twelfth birthday, him holding up a Murray cod. There he was, a Top Gun hairdo and a bad suit at graduation. Beside him, Joanne, in a black dress and dark straight hair, and Ingrid, in a red dress, blonde hair done up in some sort of bun. Other people crowded into the shot, but it was the three of them the photo was aimed at. He and Ingrid were grinning into the camera, Joanne with a small smile, perhaps a smirk. He looked at it closely before passing it to Helen. Such children, she said. You really are so young. You'd call us children? The word rang in his mind. His mother nodded. Anyone under 25 is a child to me. 
Looking at the image again, he could see why. On the cusp of adulthood, perhaps, but juvenile nonetheless. Joanne seemed a little older, but he and Ingrid could well be described as kids. Mark noted the time, finished the rest of his gin, and went to get ready for the reunion, surprising himself by feeling a flicker of nerves. The invitation forwarded to him by Ingrid stated, Class of 89, a chance to catch up with old friends and share tales from the last 30 or 32 years. He put his shirt on, eyes averted from the bathroom mirror where his gut hung like a side of beef over the top of his jeans. Suck it in, old man, he breathed to himself, turning away. What tales could he share? Police college? Police work? Kelly? The kids? The occasional game of tennis and trip to Bali? What tales wouldn't he share? The tales that were, he recognised, the true parts of himself. Not the actions themselves, but the reasons behind. The loneliness. The laziness. The yearning. The drinking. And the mourning for a life that promised much, but delivered less. He checked his phone, a text from Kelly. Be there around 8.30pm. He texted back. Come to the North O.F. Keen. He regretted the text. Why ask his wife to come to a school reunion? Kelly would hate hearing all about his younger years and the schoolboy talk. He'd hate having to introduce her to people whose names he couldn't remember. Oh well, not much else he could do but get hammered. But only after he talked to Joanne and Ingrid. Only then could he truly relax. His phone beeped. Not Kelly. Jagdeep. She'd sent a photo, no accompanying message. He held it up close. Studied it. Didn't know why she'd sent that. He'd seen it before. He looked at it. Still didn't know what Jag was getting at. Looked again. Still didn't get it. And then, and then, he did. Chapter 40 The photo was of notes that both he and Jagdeep had read before. Old case notes, recorded by some tired cop in a Port York station 30 years before. The writing looked hurried. No doubt the policeman, or woman, on duty was run off their feet with phone calls from the public and media. The humdrum of police life, so often filled with red herrings. But there it was, and, fishy or not, it filled Mark with dread. Person A saw a car being driven by a woman who looked like a killer. Person B saw a driver in a Sahara Land Cruiser who was most definitely on drugs, two kids beside him. We should definitely lock him up. Person C had a feeling that he'd seen what happened in a dream and that the culprit is now in a hospital suffering heart pains. Mark read it again and called Jagdeep. This time, she picked up the phone. The Land Cruiser, he said. Same vehicle as the one in the photo with the sisters who went missing, John Babers. I know. Her voice cut in and out. Time to bring Baber in. He agreed. The children... As before, Jagdeep's voice came through in uneven spurts. Babe doesn't have kids. Most likely not him, of course. Of course. It wasn't enough for an arrest. Not by a long shot. But the sighting and the article warranted a conversation of the hard kind. Eighteen-year-olds look like children to older people. Mark thought of his mother referring to him as a child in the photos. They called them kids. It didn't seem like much. He didn't say it aloud. Worth checking out, though. You going to call Baber in tomorrow, then? What's that? Finding it hard to hear you. Mark repeated. Are you going to call Baber in to the station tomorrow? Actually, I'll be in Carter's in just over two hours. Jagdeep said. Could drop in tonight. I... It's been in Adelaide for a few days. She said something about the roadhouse. Packed, doing a roaring trade, all the tourists of the rock. Her voice faded out. I'll wait till tomorrow to call Baber in. Mark spoke loudly down the phone, heard a distant crackle. Get Daryl to meet you there. No need for you to go there tonight. Yes, I think that would be better. Aaron? Good. John, you can tomorrow. Another crackle. It was no use. Jagdeep's phone was cactus.
After the call, Mark thought about John Baber, a good citizen, solid and reliable. No heroics in his past. But what was it that couple from the Opal said about the man? Could set your watch by him. A punctual man. Reliable as heartburn. John Baber was the sort of man you'd call if something went wrong. If, for example, your television wouldn't work, or if your car broke down, or if a generator wasn't working and you needed lights for your party. A thought was building in Mark, probing around the edge of his conscious, swelling. When he arrived, everyone cheered like idiots. Mark repeated Darrell's earlier words aloud. John was known to be reliable, punctual. So why was he late to the New Year's Eve party in 1989? Everyone was waiting for him to fix the generator. Mark looked at his own watch, time to be heading off to the party. There would probably be a disco ball, strobe lights even. It was the 32nd reunion, after all. On his way to the party and walking beneath a mild sky, Mark thought again of Baber, the things he could say about him. Solid citizen, husband to the local doctor, dependable, always ready to help. Then he added... John Baber is not always punctual. John Baber gives lifts to hitchhikers. John Baber found a dead man on the side of the road. At the front of the Northo, Mark was relieved to see a woman handing out name tags. Maria, the woman said, pointing towards her own tag. Bet you wouldn't have recognised me. It was true, he wouldn't. The woman before him had sleek, long, blonde hair, wore white jeans and some sort of flimsy top. Leo Sayer, eat your heart out. You haven't changed a bit, he said. Maria gave him a look somewhere between a smile and a sneer and turned towards the other people now lined up. Mark cast around, trying to spot familiar faces. A reedy, someone shouted out. Come and have a drink, you big prick. A face was smiling into his, sunburnt and large. Spadger, he said, relieved to remember. How are you, mate? Spadger was good, still lived in the old town, married with three kids, concreter, had a boat for water skiing, bit of fishing, got to Thailand last year with the family, saw some strange things, some really fucking strange things. You ever seen a ping pong show, Mark? He hadn't, was glad of it, but curious all the same. Spadger continued, fucking weird shit that ping pong show, and not the whole of it. Someone interrupted them, Cheryl somebody. Mark remembered her too, got another beer, started to feel his joints loosen. Compared to Spadger, he thought, catching his reflection in the bar window, he didn't look too bad. Compared to Cheryl, he looked like Brad Pitt. Cheryl was good. She still lived in the old town too, married with two kids, also got the stepdaughter. Didn't have a boat, but a bit of land down the river, and kept a little shed there for when they went camping, fishing and whatnot. Remember you caught that massive cod, Mark? Never been to Thailand, but went to Surfers Paradise three years ago and did all the worlds. Mark drank his beer. Spadger, Cheryl and another who joined their group looked to him. His turn. I'm good. Living the big smoke. Married with two kids. No steps as yet. Don't have a boat or a bit of land. Been to Bali a couple of times. Ubud and whatnot. Mum showed me a photo of that massive cod, Cheryl. I must have been about twelve. Yeah, I'm a cop. Don't hold it against me. Yet, made it over that wall in training. Not too bad, but couldn't do it now. Their small group nodded, satisfied. Everyone had told their tale adequately. It was enough, and now to drink. Mark drank, beer and a red wine. Checked his phone. No calls from Kelly. He went to the bathroom, had a chat to a bloke he played footy with who was now a doctor and who had been to Bali and Thailand and also Paris. While walking out of the bathroom towards the bar and hearing about the man's marital status, he saw Joanne enter the room. Joanne and Ingrid, not far behind. He started towards them, but was interrupted by a woman whose name he thought might be Christy or Kirsty. Margarita. The woman was very drunk. Remember you called me a fat slag in year 11? Mark suddenly felt ill. Did I really call you that? Christy, or Kirsty, gave him a hard slap on the back. Only joking, Ariti. Got you a beauty, though, didn't I? Mark breathed a sigh of relief and felt a wave of gratitude when Joanne and Ingrid joined them. Hello, Olivia, Ingrid was saying, 
hugging the woman. Joanne stood beside her, a faint smile on her face. The three of them listened as Olivia told them what she was doing with her life, who she married, where she went on holidays, and what she did for a living. Mark felt himself drifting when he heard Ingrid exclaim, Grave inscriber, that's amazing. Olivia smiled proudly and the others looked at her with admiration. What would you have written on your tombstone? Mark asked the women. When your number's up, it's up, Olivia said. And even Joanne laughed. Ingrid thought for a second. She liked this sort of thing. I'd have succumbed to general wear and tear. You, Joanne? His old friend rolled her eyes. Died of thirst. Their small group was overtaken by a larger one, and Mark watched how easily Ingrid mingled, laughing and touching people on the arm as she spoke. Joanne was more reticent, smiling, but detached, as she had been for all those years. He went to the bar, saw that she followed. How's the coast going? she asked, not looking at him, but somewhere in the direction of Ingrid. I have to ask you a few questions, Mark said, clearing his throat. I need you to shed some light on a few things. Joanne ordered a vodka, lime and soda, leant against the bar, shaking her head. Ingrid staying in that little room with me that night, she said. Is that all you've got? Honestly, Mark, just call the case closed. There's nothing there. There's more, he said, and wished he hadn't already drunk so much. There are so many other more important things you should be looking into. Joanne said, handing over money to the barwoman and taking a drink. Crimes that are happening right now, not a hundred years ago. Not a hundred, Joanne. Just thirty-two. Together they gazed out into the crowd where now dancing had begun to some tune from their youth. Duran Duran, maybe. In any case, there they were, the class of eighty-nine, dancing and having the time of their lives. Just thirty-odd years ago, they were all eighteen or nineteen, on the cusp of life. Ingrid, dancing hard in the midst of a group, beckoned for them to join in. Joanne, looking half-amused, shook her head, and Mark mouthed, No. The grave inscriber sashayed up to them. Come on, she said. Just one dance, for Christ's sake. Don't be boring. Mark turned to Joanne. She was his old friend, no matter what was happening now. He took her by the arm. Come on, he said. Let's not be the boring old farts by the bar. Let's have a bit of a dance. Before it all goes to shit, he wanted to add. To his surprise, Joanne put down her glass and allowed herself to be led to the middle of the floor. And so they danced. To all the 80s music. To Madonna, to Prince, to ACDC and Jimmy Barnes. The class of 89 danced with abandon, forgetting about their shitty jobs, the school fees their failing marriages, their disappointing sex lives, and the stains on their new white shirts. The class of 89 danced knowing that at the next reunion, some of them might not be there, and that all of them were on their way there. Fifty years old, most of them were. The class of 89. The doctors. The policemen. The childminders. The grave inscribers. The concreters. For just this one song, they were young again. They were beautiful again and they had their whole lives in front of them. But always, the song must end, and when it did, the class of 89 smiled at each other a little self-consciously, a little embarrassed, and very red-faced. The party drifted off. People had to go and relieve babysitters. The grave inscriber had work in the morning. The hardcore drinkers and lecherous divorcees were off to the bonfire. Mark searched around for Joanne and Ingrid, they were by the door, saying goodbye to people. He hurried after them, delayed a little by the doctor who insisted on swapping numbers. Numbers exchanged, dates to catch up half agreed on. He walked out into the cool night and shoved his hands deep in his pockets. At first he couldn't see them, but then he caught the dark figures of Ingrid and Joanne walking close together on the footpath a short distance away. The two of them were indistinguishable in the weak light of the street lamp. They could have been the same person for all he knew. He jogged towards them and they both turned around at the sound of his approach, startled and pale in the night. Need to talk to you two tomorrow, he said. Stick around for a bit, can you? Joanne continued walking, folded her arms. 
Just talk to us now, Mark. I'm leaving early in the morning. Ingrid shrugged, looking towards the river, the dark trees hugging it, hiding it. Neither of you two heard the name John Baber? Joanne shook her head, and Ingrid said no, exhaling loudly. He pulled out his phone, and the two women stopped, exchanging glances. Mark began searching in his phone for the photo of John beside his vehicle, the one that Phoebe had taken. Here, he said, finding it and holding the phone out. Recognise this man? The women leant in close to the screen, narrowing their eyes. Then, in one quick motion, Joanne stepped back, jaw clenched. Ingrid remained still, the two saying nothing. See? Mark enlarged the photo, John's face taking up most of the screen. Seen this man before? In the streetlight, Ingrid's face appeared a deathly white. She slapped a hand to her mouth. God, she half whispered. You recognise him? Ingrid turned to Joanne, her voice a strangle. It's him. A moment of shocked silence. Mark went in hard. There's evidence of another body at the site where Michael Denby was found. Probably one of two sisters who went missing or, or a Dutch woman. Ingrid breathed. Isa Ann Modderman. Ingrid, Joanne warned. You need to... How the hell do you know this? Mark wasn't in the mood to be kind. I've known for a long time. Suspected it for longer. With a jolt, Mark had a sudden thought. What's Sanders' surname, Ingrid? Modderman. <laughs> what took you so long? Mark breathed hard. <sighs> Isa was Sanders' sister. Ingrid nodded. Joanne stood back, arms clenched over her chest. Mark shook his head, trying to make sense of it. He moved in front of them both. Tell me everything. Now. Ingrid looked at Joanne, her voice a plea. We've got to tell him, Joe. Please. Joanne's eyes were steely in the weak light. I want a lawyer, she said. Chapter 41 Mark looked at his old friends standing now like two halves, one broken, one brittle. He thought of Jag Deep calling Baber in, turned on his phone, dialed her number, watching the two women as he did so. Straight to message bank. He called again. Whatever this is, whatever happened, we can protect you, he said, and far above a night bird gave a strangled cry. There's no need to be afraid. Mark. <laughs> Joanne gave a half laugh. You really don't know much about the law, do you? I... He looked at his phone, noticed the glittering lights, a missed message, Jag Deep. The law doesn't protect victims. Joanne's voice was hard. It doesn't protect them at all. We all have to protect ourselves, Mark. Don't you see? He was ringing his messages, dialing the number, and all the while images raced across his eyes. The girls in the car, John giving the sisters a lift, John being late to the New Year's Eve party, John Baber who was never late. Jagdeep's voice broke out loud and clear in the still night. Get help! She screamed over the phone. John, it's... No! Please, no! And then a crackling. And then horrible silence. The two women stared at him while he tried to call back, punching numbers into his phone. Jagdeep, he thought, please be okay and suddenly he wanted nothing more than for Jagdeep, his colleague, to be safe. He rang the number, and all three listened in vain as the warm night passed by, and a single gum leaf fell from the sky and settled on the ground by their feet. They listened, but the phone was dead. Five minutes before, Jagdeep pulled into the long driveway of John Baber's house. She was alone, saw no need to call up Daryl on a Saturday night and ask him to join her. She considered Mark's idea of meeting John the next day, but decided this would be easiest. The long drive up from Adelaide had made her weary. She wanted to get home and lie on the couch. Wedding plans and guest lists loomed. Those made her weary too. It had been a busy couple of days. She put a few quick questions to Baber now, ring Mark with an update, 
and then fall asleep over a toasted sandwich. John Baber's property was quiet, no vehicle at the front. No lights on in the house either, but as she walked up to the front door, she heard something crash. A distinct crash, something being broken. She called out, peering through the window, the single glow of a match or torch lit up the room for an instant before falling into darkness again. Jagdeep thought vaguely of leaving, coming back in the morning, but now she was here, it seemed stupid not to investigate. Hello, she called, and from somewhere inside there was another crash. Her voice shook. John? There was a sick taste in the back of her throat. She turned the door handle. Hello? And pushed. It was open, and she stepped inside, started walking towards the faint glow at the end of the hall, where she knew the lounge room to be. Another thudding sound now, and she sped up to a slow trot, one hand tracing the wall, the other clasping her side, feeling the shape of the taser. John? She cried again, as she flung open the door of the lounge room to reveal an empty space. She reached for her phone, rang the first number on her calls list. Mark. No response. She reached for a light switch, her hands searching over the wall. Finding one, she flicked it on to darkness. Nothing. The electricity was gone. John? She called more hesitantly, turning on her phone's torch and slowly shining it around the room. Hello? The beam of light lit up the room in long, narrow shards. A bang from the wall near the fireplace and the light trembled, then focused on the mirror above. No, she breathed, her hands fumbling her phone and dialing the first number there. Get help! And then she screamed. Mark called the station at Cutter's End, left a message there, called the Port York cops too, even though they were at least five hours away, told them what he'd learnt, what he'd heard. With assurances they'd be travelling up to see her, he paced around the quiet street, checking his phone, waiting for a response. Jagdeep. What happened? He said to Ingrid and Joanne, his voice angry. Just tell me what happened. It's now or down at the station with some other cop. I'm done with you two. Joanne stood with her arms still folded, staring somewhere beyond the trees. Ingrid, looking at her for a moment, spoke. I'll tell you everything, Mark. I've wanted to for ages. In a way, I tried to tell you the truth. It was there all along. Mark rolled his hand for her to continue. Remember I said that the man who gave me a lift was Don or Ron? It was true. I didn't know his name, but now I know his name was John. I left stuff out, but I told you stuff too. A fog began to lift somewhere in the back of Mark's head. Well, you could have been clearer, Ingrid. I know, but in a way, I suppose, I wanted you to keep questioning me. Get to the truth. I'm tired of all this. It's been so long. Tell me. And she did. Chapter 42 New Year's Eve, 1989 A lift! She'd be in Cutter's End by tonight. Maybe even get to that New Year's Eve party everyone in Adelaide had told her about. That would be good. She buckled her seatbelt, turned to the man who was driving. I'm Ingrid, she said, and he nodded before looking out the window and pulling onto the road. Ingrid turned to see that the old creep from the roadhouse was staring at her through the window, the fading light on the glass giving him a ghostly air. She smiled back hard, giving him the finger as they drove off. Stuff you, you old sleaze, she thought. I'll never have to see you in your shitty shop again. Been travelling long? The man asked, turning onto the highway. No, Ingrid replied. Just a few weeks. Have a break after school and all that. There was a silence. Ingrid worked to fill it. Year 12 was so full on. We just needed to get out of town, have a holiday before uni starts up. Maybe get a bit of work. Another awkward pause. Skimpy, are ya? The question startled Ingrid. What? No. She felt a vague ache in the back of her head. She stretched her hands, 
placed them on her knees, rubbed them together. The man's car had a faint whiff of hospital. It was very clean. Ingrid shifted on her seat, aware of how dusty and unkempt she must appear. You meeting up with anyone tonight? He asked, and they gained speed on the long highway headed north. She looked at him sideways. No, she said. Well, hopefully my friend Joanne. There was a mix-up last night and we've missed each other today. She get lucky, did she? The man laughed and Ingrid gave a weak smile. Maybe he was kind of a creep, she thought. Just my luck. I said, did she get lucky? The man's voice had an edge to it and, changing gears, he looked at her. Ingrid stared straight ahead, the drumming in the back of her head growing louder. I don't know, she said. You girls should be more careful. People think you're sluts. How you go around sleeping with anyone you meet, it's wrong. A thrumming now behind her eyes. She studied her knees. Anything could happen to you, the man was saying. I mean, look at where we are. You lot must be really fucking stupid. Ingrid looked outside to the enormous empty landscape. Her brain raced and she heard her voice shake. We should be more careful, she said in a weak voice. You're all the same. He shook his head. She sat still, tried to control her breathing, tried to think. Couldn't. I've seen them all, he continued. Aussies, Dutch, or what the fuck? You never learn, do you? I need to go to the toilet. Can we please stop? The man stared straight ahead, muttered something under his breath. I want to get out now, please. Ingrid's voice shook. Her whole body trembled. Shut the fuck up, will you? You lot never stop squawking. Ingrid crept her left hand to the door handle. Outside the world sped on by. Thousands of kilometres of desert and no towns and no people. We haven't passed one car she thought, and not one car has passed us. The man sped up, his anger and her fear filling the space. Fingers on the door, a sob in her throat. Ingrid felt that she was ready to open it when she saw something out of the corner of her eye, a piece of colour underneath her shoe. She moved her foot slightly to the side and for a second was struck dumb a silver and black velvet scrunchie, the one Joanne had borrowed. And then, with a gaping realisation, she threw open the car door at the same time as the man veered suddenly to the side of the road and continued driving through the scrub. Frantically, she tried to unbuckle her seatbelt and the man grabbed at her arm. For a moment, she was half suspended out the car, watching the earth speed below, watching rocks, dirt, a blaze of red and brown, With an aching jolt, he pulled her back into the car and turned the wheel suddenly. Her head hit the dashboard and then... all went black. A text on Mark's phone from an unknown number. John Baber. He texted back. Jag? No reply. What next? Mark asked. They'd crossed the road, following Ingrid. Ingrid slumped on the riverbank while Joanne and Mark stood the former leaning against a gum tree, still not speaking. Bleary and bruised, Ingrid woke to a darkening sky and blood in her mouth. It took her a minute to remember all that had occurred, and when she did, she tried to call, but there was something in her mouth, a cloth, and it made it hard to breathe or cry. Joanne! She screamed from the back of her throat. Joanne! She was tied to a tree with cable wire, her arms in front of her around the skinny trunk. Half kneeling, slumped, she rested her cheek on the trunk and cried for Joanne. In front of her, perhaps five metres, the vehicle was parked, still with the passenger side door open. Joanne! She cried, and then, Help! Footsteps to the back of her and a rough hand reached down, grabbing her by the hair. Shut the fuck up, he said, banging her forehead on the bark of the tree. 
She cringed from his hand, sank down lower, tried to make herself as small as possible, away from his sight. He walked past her up to the vehicle and reaching from the rear of the ute, peeled back the tarpaulin. With one movement, he pulled up a struggling, hunched figure and threw it on the ground. Joanne. Ingrid watched as her friend lay there in a fetal position, hands tied behind her back, brown hair covering her face, and mouth bound with a gag the same as hers. The girls watched each other. They'd known each other all their lives. Speech does not need words. The man lit a cigarette, pondered them. Two Aussies. The girls kept their eyes on him. Ingrid's breath suspended. She felt the world constrict. The man went to the front of the car, opened the passenger side glove box and got out some pills, throwing them in his mouth. So fucking messy, he said. Messing up my truck. He put a knee up on the seat and began chucking things out. A coffee cup, a folded bit of paper, the scrunchie. Ingrid felt a renewed panic and tried rubbing the cable against the tree trunk, wriggling her hands within the ties. Joanne, seeing what she was doing, gave a small nod. While the man raged about his vehicle, now scrubbing the seats with a cloth, Ingrid rubbed and rubbed at the cable till bits of bark flaked off the tree and her wrists grated against the cord. It was no use, she saw that. The cable would never give, but still she tried, small patches of blood appearing on her skin. The man was now in the rear seat, ranting. Ingrid rested her forehead on the bark of the thin tree. In her line of vision, she could see Joanne raising herself on her elbow and attempting to sit up. Ingrid felt then that she would die, and Joanne would die too. Out here alone and with no one to know. She looked at the bark, felt its dry surface, felt her tears on it, and saw that they coloured it dark. She focused not on Joanne, now sitting up, or on the man, burrowed in the back of his ute, rearranging things and swearing. She focused on the tree, and saw that there were markings on it, three distinct markings. And now, when she blocked out the sight of Joanne and the man swearing and the pain in her wrists and knees and head, she could see that they were initials. I am. Just like hers. I am. It was a sign, she thought, as the sun made its final descent. She would always be here, no matter what happened. I am. Her initials were here. She was here. She was here. With great effort, she called. Joe! And though it came out as a strangled cry, she could see that Joanne raised her head, looked at her. Ingrid wanted to tell her friend what she'd seen, but now the man was coming towards her, not seeing Joanne and walking fast. Forgetting the initials, she tried to stand by hugging the tree and then inching upwards. In the background, Joanne looked at her hard, trying to say something, but Ingrid didn't know what. Night set in. Another text on Mark's phone. Same number as before. Jag OK. Fooby D in station. Call us. Daryl. A moment of confusion. Fooby? He looked up at Ingrid, unable and unwilling for her to stop. She stood, feet apart, hands wrapped around the tree like a lover. He came towards her. Five steps away. Four away. Three steps away. She bent her knees a little, mind a whirlpool, tried to spit out the gag. He put his face close to hers. You're a noisy bitch, aren't you? See how that goes for you. They usually stop after a night. He stroked the side of her face and she turned away, straining. Aussies, he said again, fumbling at her top, feeling under it and making her gag. Two more bloody slutty Aussies. Ingrid clenched her eyes shut, stepped away from the tree 
arms stretched out around it. He moved closer to her, rubbing his body on her side, nuzzling into her face and neck. Moving her face from side to side, she felt bile rise up in her throat, and she began to gag. And then, when she opened her eyes for a brief moment, she could see that Joanne had, in some incredible feat, brought her tied hands from behind her back underneath her, and they were now in front of her body. Her friend was trying to stand. The man was feeling the front of her jeans now, and she stood still, hating him, hating the world. But she must give Joanne time. Her mind went blank, and she thought only of the initials on the bark. I A M. Joanne was limping now, half running around the front of the vehicle and slipping into it, her eyes always on Ingrid. Ingrid locked eyes with her friend, thought of nothing else but the initials on the tree. From far above, a bird gave a cry and Ingrid thought that it was a sign. Of hope or horror, she didn't know, but it had to mean something. The man gave a groaning sound, but still, Ingrid looked only at Joanne. Time stretched and lengthened, moment after terrible moment, but still, Ingrid looked only at her friend. The engine started and the man turned, giving a half yell and trying to run, at the same time pulling up his jeans. Just move! Ingrid tried to call out, and the engine stalled. No! The man was closer to the car now, a metre away, and the engine started up again. Half a metre, and Joanne slammed her foot on the accelerator and put the engine into reverse. Ingrid was shouting, shouting for her friend, wanting her to drive, drive away, but the man was getting closer to the vehicle, and the wheels were spinning in the sand. Even so, the vehicle sped up and backed away fast. Ingrid felt her heart leap. Joanne would be free. But then she saw Joanne hesitate, was slowing, had stopped with the engine still running. No! Ingrid tried to yell, sobbing now, pulling, pulling, pulling at the wire on her wrists. She could see through the lights of the vehicle's interior that Joanne was looking directly at her in the beams. Ingrid looked back, saw her oldest friend and willed her to turn the ute and drive off. When she heard the changing of gears again, heard the engine rev, and Joanne, rather than turning around to certain freedom, drove straight into the man who was running towards her. She ran straight into him and over him and he collapsed, screaming in the dirt. With the engine still running, Joanne leapt out of the car and ran to her. Joanne had returned to save her. Love surged like a wave. Hurry, hurry, hurry! Either she or Joanne was saying, Hurry, hurry, hurry! The man's leg was trapped under a wheel and he roared, trying to pull himself out. Hurry, hurry, hurry! Now Joanne was running back to the tray of the vehicle, rummaging around. Hurry, hurry, hurry! Joanne found a knife and raced back, running the blade back and forth across the cable till it broke. Ingrid pulled the gag out of her mouth and let out a sob. The man was still trying to pull himself away, groaning and swearing. Hurry, hurry, hurry! As Ingrid took the knife from Joanne and cut the cable ties from her too. Let's go, Ingrid said. Let's just drive, leave him here. We'll go to the police. Let's go, Joanne. But her friend walked over to where the man was squirming on the dirt. Get me out of here, he said. I wasn't going to hurt you. Really, I'm sorry. Get me out. Joanne kicked him hard in the head. Let's go, Joanne, Ingrid said. Come on. Joanne knelt down by the man, away from his stretched out, pleading arms. You fucking asshole, she said in a low voice. You piece of shit. Let's move, Joe. Ingrid was screaming now, and the man seemed to gain some leverage, started trying to sit up pulling away from the car. He's getting up! Joanne kicked him again, hard in the face. He tried to grab at her leg, and she jerked away quick. You think you can get away with this? Joanne was not listening to Ingrid. The man said something. What was that? Joanne said, holding her hand up for Ingrid to be quiet. 
What did you say? Slut, the man said. Stupid sluts, always getting yourselves into trouble. What did you fucking expect? You put out raw meat and don't expect flies. Ingrid stood, pleading, crying, standing on one foot, then the other, urging her to go. But Joanne was at the tray of the ute again, and then the front passenger seat. She came back with a jerry can, and the man looked up at her with understanding. No, he said. You wouldn't. Joanne began pouring the petrol over the man's head and upper body before throwing the can away. Say you're sorry, she said. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the man said, trying to wipe the petrol out of his eyes. Say, I'm a piece of shit. I'm a piece of shit, I'm a piece of shit. Now, Joanne said, that's all you needed to do. Come on, Joe, Ingrid urged. We don't need to drive, we'll just get another lift, go to the police, or go back to the roadhouse. Yes, come on, Joanne. He's not going anywhere with the car on top of him. Let's leave. Leave. Please, the man said. I'll never do this again. I never meant to hurt you. Please, I've got a family. Joanne stood above him, matches at her side. I've got a daughter, he said. And then Joanne threw the match. Chapter 43 Mark slumped against the side of a tree. Jesus, he said. Joanne's voice came out of the dark. I'm glad I did it. I've never been more glad of something in my life. Because of what happened in America. Joanne gave him a sharp glance, then shook her head. Not just that, but yes, that too. If we had let him go, no one would ever have taken our side. This is the end of the 80s, remember? Rapists were being let off left, right and centre. He'd done it before, Ingrid said. I A M, Isa Ann Motterman. And probably the sisters, Raylene and Adele from Warnbean. Mark said. You were researching them too, weren't you? Yes, Ingrid admitted. For ages. I've told their older sister what we did too. It was harder this time. I'm friends with her. She wanted to be close to them all, didn't you, Ingrid? The families, the friends. Joanne sounded bitter rather than angry. All this time, despite my pleading, you just couldn't let it go. I had to tell them what I knew. Imagine not knowing. And besides, it could have been... It could have been us. And did you think the families would be happy when they found out? Mark asked. Of course they'd be fucking happy. Joanne turned on him. Wouldn't you? Would he? If someone attacked or abused his boys, what sort of justice would he want? Where did all the anger and grief go? Ingrid sat with her head between her hands, and Joanne continued. The man was burnt up badly, just screaming and screaming. Ingrid kept shouting at us to leave, I was worried about the noise, and we knew he wouldn't last long. The sound. He can't believe what it sounds like. A man like that, screaming in pain. For a moment, Joanne looked as if she was almost smiling. Ingrid wanted to take the car, but we thought that someone might pick us up for it being stolen, or he might manage to scramble away somewhere, or... We weren't thinking straight. Really, we didn't know what the hell we were doing. You didn't think to go to the police? Ingrid wanted to. I was a firm no. We hadn't been raped, or not exactly. Joanne gave a brief glance to Ingrid. What we had done was run over a man and burn him to death. We were two young women, scared, panicked really, and we weren't thinking clearly at all. Besides, Joanne's voice was hard. What would the cops do, really? Joanne grew quiet, as if listening to something in the dark. Mark waited. The screams died down, and we just ran. We ran to the highway, 
thinking we'd just get a lift somewhere or something. I don't know. And then almost straight away, a vehicle came towards us. John Baber. Well, whoever it is in the photo you showed us. Him. He pulled up and we got in. And we must have looked in a bad way because he did a U-turn saying he'd drive us back to the roadhouse and help us make a call. But the thing is, I started to feel calm. The man, he said his name, but I thought it was Don or Ron. He seemed nice, not like the other one. I said that we'd had a scary experience hitchhiking, but we'd got out of the car and we were now okay. I said that we'd probably end up staying in the roadhouse. I felt kind of numb. Ingrid was quiet. I even managed small talk. He said he was on his way to a party, with fuel for the generator to fix the lights. I remember that because I was concentrating on listening very carefully. For some reason, whatever that man said seemed to me to be the most important thing in the world. He was, I think, a kind man. He offered us ham sandwiches, but we said no. He said that he was always eating ham sandwiches and that it used to drive his wife mad. I think he was trying to put us at ease. It's strange that I remember all of this so clearly. He advised us not to hitchhike again, said there were buses up and down the highway all the time now. I said that that seemed very sensible. He dropped us off at the roadhouse and we went to the toilets outside to wash our faces. Ingrid had a bad cut or bruise on her forehead. She covered it with her hair. The man waited for us to see if we were okay. I think he even offered us money for the bus the next day. I went inside and booked a room for one night. I didn't mention Ingrid. Didn't think of it. Just paid for a night. Ingrid spoke up, her voice listless. When we got to Cutter's End the next day via the bus, I wrote the wrong date on the backpacker's register to make it look like I was there the night before. I just thought it would make things easier. I'd eradicate the whole night, erase it from my memory, and if we were questioned, I wouldn't have to explain the time lapse from when I was in the roadhouse to getting there the day after. It was Joanne who booked the night at the roadhouse, not me. No one saw me there. So I wrote down the wrong date. Probably it was stupid. It wasn't stupid, Mark thought. It had cost the investigation time and money. It had given her space to move further from the crime. Joanne continued. When I came out after booking the night, the man, John, was still there. He said if we needed anything, we could look him up in Cutter's End. We said thank you. He left. I said hi to some weird guy in the next room, and we tried to get to sleep. Ingrid was crying and crying. It was an awful night. The crying, Mark thought. It looked like laughing on the videotape. We never saw John again till you showed us that photo. Joanne swept up her hair and tied it into a bun, businesslike. Mark breathed out. He was quiet for a moment. <sighs> so, Denby didn't rape you. But he did kidnap you both against your will. He sexually assaulted Ingrid. He probably had intentions to rape and murder. He could have gone to the police. Joanne laughed. <laughs> we got in the car willingly with him, remember? Two young girls, no doubt seen kissing boys the night before in some pub. Great witnesses we would have made, the media would have had a field day. Still, the police would have made a report and... I repeat, said Joanne, we ran over and burnt him to death. You know the police wouldn't have been much help. This was then. Great for high hair and lace, not so much for women on trial for murder. Especially when we'd been picking up. They'd have brought up all sorts of shit about us. In America, want to know what the cops asked me when I reported the rape? They asked me how many men I'd slept with and what was the reason I wore red underpants that night. It's not even worth it. Mark suddenly felt immeasurably tired. I'll have to report all of this.
he said. You know I will. Do it, Ingrid said. I just want it over and done with. There'll be a lot of sympathy for you both. Of course there will, Joanne said. You'll have people wanting to make martyrs out of us. It's the cops who'll look bad when all the stats on rape trials and assaults from 30 years ago come out. The law's a dog, Mark, waiting to be shot. He was quiet, and Joanne moved closer to Ingrid. You know what, Ingrid? She said softly. We could just push Mark into the river right now. He was drunk. He slipped and drowned. Shut up, Ingrid said, and Mark looked up to see Joanne sneer. I don't regret throwing a match on that asshole, Joanne said. From the moment he picked me up on my way to the bus stop, after hearing I was planning to meet Ingrid, and after he bound and gagged me and threw me in the back of his vehicle, I knew I'd kill him. He drove for hours, hours around Port York and God knows where else, getting petrol, getting snacks, talking to people so that I could hear, and all the time I thought, you're going to die, motherfucker. And then when I saw what he was doing to Ingrid, I knew he would die in pain. I just knew it. Throwing that match was the best thing I've ever done. Put that in your report, acting inspector. Chapter 44 When Mark woke the next morning, Kelly was beside him, curled up like a little bird. He could barely remember stumbling in last night, wandering around like a blind man trying to find the bathroom, the bed. And here she was, Kelly. He thought about brushing the hair from the side of her face or giving her a kiss on the forehead, but decided against it. Her sleeping expression was grim. No doubt she was dreaming of her case, of violent men on the loose, of injustice all round. He sat on the edge of the bed and looked out the window to his mother's garden. Ingrid, Joanne, John Baber, Michael Denby. He would have to write it all up in the report, due to be submitted to Angelo tomorrow. He wandered into the kitchen and made himself a cup of tea, took it to the table where he opened up his laptop. His head ached, his chest hurt. He needed to ring Daryl to see what had happened in Cutter's End, hear how Jagdeep was. He rubbed his neck. He needed to tell them about Ingrid and Joanne. He must. Mark rang the station's phone at Cutter's End and was put through to Jagdeep's home number. His colleague was okay. She was shaken. What a shock it was to see Fooby there, crouching in the darkness. Tell you all about it soon. Work to be done. But glad the case was coming to an end. They would be talking to John in the Arvo, cover all bases and whatnot. But really, what's the point? Jagdeep said. So what if John gave lifts to the sisters? Daryl says he probably did too, for all he can remember and I checked out that early report of the vehicle on New Year's Eve 89, which matches John's. It definitely states there were two kids in the car. Oh, and Daryl says hello. He's sorry he sent you that text with John's name on it. Thought he was replying to the Port York cops, asking whose house we were at. We told them to turn around and go back. No point coming up to Cutters. It was just that I got a fright with Fooby being there, that's all. Jagdeep seemed hyped up, energized by the night. It felt like years ago that Mark was frantically punching numbers on his phone, desperate for someone to help. Her energy would fade, he knew. When the adrenaline died down, she'd recall her earlier fright, however trivialising she made it out to be. Once, Kelly told him how her clients, victims of family violence, relived their fears over and over, years after the event. Terror, she said, always returns. Jagdeep asked for his Adelaide address. She said she had something to send him in the mail. Are you going to get any rest today, Jag? he asked. You've had a big night. Soon, she said. Let's talk tomorrow. Mark didn't tell her what he'd learnt the previous night from Joanne and Ingrid. Not just yet, he thought. Jagdeep needed a rest after her shock at Baber's house. Yes, no need to tell anyone immediately. He talked to his colleagues later. He needed to write it all down first, get it straight in his head. The report would do the trick. Then he'd tell them everything. Then. The report. Where to begin with these last revelations? Begin at the start, he thought. 
Begin with what the girls told you, and then work backwards, to the video of them in the same room on New Year's Eve. Of the lying. Link the bones found by forensics at the scene to the possible disappearance of Isa, Raylene and Adele, and so on. Up to this point, Angelo had received next to nothing, only reports on the initial interviews and so forth. This one would blow Superintendent Conti's mind. Mark began, titled it, Final Report, Acting Inspector Ariti, Denby Case, and was in the thick of writing what Joanne and Ingrid had told him about the night of New Year's Eve when his mother came singing into the room. She'd been to Mass, and would he like a cup of tea? Mass, Mark thought. He hadn't been since he left home, and never had the desire to. In films or books, it was always a cathedral or a church the cop went to for respite, or to think. Usually a kind and wise priest would turn up to offer gentle words of advice and wisdom. Save that for the movies, he thought. But he did feel envious of those movie cops. Some gentle words, sage advice, he could do with that right now. His mother asked him how Kelly was. Still asleep, he said. Well, she's not, his mother said. She's up now, gone out walking by the river. Mark shrugged. Do you want some advice? His mother asked. Are you a priest, Mum? His mother gave him a blank look. Kelly's not happy. You're not happy. I don't know what's going on, but you two need to have a chat. Your father and I used to discuss everything. Yes, Mark thought. That was true. His parents did discuss everything, usually while one of them was throwing a plate against the wall or storming outside to rage in the garden. Okay, Mum, I'll have a chat to her. Just got to continue this. Go now, she said. It's a shame she didn't bring the boys. I would have looked after them, given her a bit of a break. Mark felt a smack of self-reproach. He hadn't even thought of his sons. He saved the report, grabbed the hat and gave a backward wave to his mother as he walked through the front gate. The roses lent in, and he smelled once more their heady scent. He didn't have to walk far to find his wife. She was in the nearby playground, trudging back towards him on a squiggly path, hands in her jeans pocket, hair loose, and makeup free. He saw at once that she was still beautiful, perhaps more so than when she was younger, and for some reason... The fact filled him with misery. Hi, he said. Hi. She gestured towards a bench and they sat down. How was last night? She asked. He told her what he'd learnt from his old friends. I'll be charged with murder, she said. He felt a heaviness in his chest. Yes. It doesn't seem right, Kelly said. No. A few years ago, I would have said that the law will do the right thing and get them off. Now, I'm not so sure. Out of my hands. But is it? Kelly turned to him, eyes bright. Do you have to report everything? Couldn't you just swing it somehow? Water down the girl's involvement or fake a report, you mean? His wife was silent for a moment. What actually is justice, Mark? It's not withholding evidence. I know that much. Kelly's shoulders sagged, and he went to put his arm around her, but she shifted away. Why are you here, Kel? I had to come and see you. Mark asked why, but already he could feel the answer. Could see it coming at him down a long corridor, howling up at him from the bottom of a cliff. I need a break. I don't think I can do this any longer. Mark spoke, hesitant. But uh, things are, are getting better, aren't they? I don't think so. Not really. There was a pause. Heavy. Is it the lawyer bloke? No. At least, I don't think so. She looked up at him. But even without him, I think we need some time apart. It's not working, and you know it. Was it something to do with him that time you were drunk and going on about next Tuesday? Mark could hear his voice, petulant. 
Yes, I think it was. I'll punch him in the face next time I see him. No, you won't. A pause. We've been trying, Kel. We have, but still, it's not the same. Kelly ran her fingers up and down the armrest of the old seat, paint flaking off with every stroke. Back and forth they went, the old recriminations and the new. A tired tennis game with a flat ball and a dodgy net. I'm moving into mum's for a bit. It's closer to work and she can help with the boys. We can work out shared care for them and we'll see how we go and... Her voice went on, on and on. Hurt as he was, Mark couldn't deny that even as he felt resentment and jealousy, a wave of relief was waiting to brush over him. It was just there, on the horizon. They sat together, staring at a child's swing set, shoulders not quite touching, already wary of how to connect. Mark thought briefly of where he would live, somewhere small, close to Kelly, near a gym, perhaps. Now was not the time to discuss finances or more permanent living arrangements, but in a small crevice of his mind, Mark was already moving on. After Kelly left, hugging Helen hard and giving him a pale goodbye, Mark went back to his report, door firmly shut to his mother's questions. The report was the thing. He wrote, hardly noting the time. The document stretched to over ten pages, including the relevant articles and photos. And as the story began to emerge, he realised once more that he needed to call Angelo. Charges would be laid, but surely there was no risk of absconding. He could, if he really wanted to, arrange for Ingrid's and Joanne's passports to be confiscated. Mark continued writing, but the early smooth flow he had been in began to falter. Something was wrong in the story. He read over his report again, went through all he had learnt in his head. He was missing something, and it nagged, like a dull toothache. The story fitted, but it didn't. Lockhart's exchange principle. He read the witness reports again, looked at where he'd written the women's account of the evening, looked at the photos of the crime scene, the ones taken when John Baber had alerted police on the 4th of January. Denby's burnt vehicle, the broken body, It fitted. The dust storm and poor weather had made any footprints obsolete. Aside from forensics, still waiting to confirm the other bone fragments, there was not much else he could see. But still, what was it? What was it? Mark looked closer, held the photo up to his nose, sat back, closed his eyes and remembered an earlier conversation, a witness statement from the first investigation, early news reports thought about them in conjunction with the image before him. He knew. Without his eyes leaving the photo, he picked up the phone and dialed Angelo's number. His boss answered on the second ring, voice heavy from old wine. Ready to move on? Angelo said. There's other cases we need men of your ilk working on. You'll need to get me a flight from Adelaide to Port York. I'll hire a car from there. I'll only need two days. This sounds interesting. Where's the report? It's almost done. Just one more thing. One more expensive bloody thing? Just do it, Angelo. Arrange it now. I can have this whole case tied up in a day. Mark waited, willing his boss. There was a pause and a clearing of the throat. (coughs) This better be good, Mark. It is. Another pause. Okay. I'll sort it. Thanks. I want this case wrapped up, Mark. Mark put the phone down, packed his bag. Chapter 45 That evening, Acting Inspector Mark Ariti, warmed with the best coffee in the world, drove past the scorched golf course and the parched scrub outlining Cutter's End. Jagdeep was at the station, deep in reports and businesslike about the encounter with Fooby. Daryl hovered around her like a butler. Mark still hadn't told them about Joanne and Ingrid, had held back, just for a little longer. Mark wound the window down and wondered at the warm air and the fierce last rays of a sun descending fast. To the northwest, 
hundreds of kilometres of red dirt and sand for as far as the eye could see. A place where so much is hidden, and yet it's so hard to remain unseen. Funny how it had all come to this, he thought, like the denouement of a novel. He would find out which twin prevailed. Or did there need to be a prevailing one? He'd been listening to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the beast within. It was with these thoughts that Mark pulled up at the front of John Baber's house. The tall man met him at the door, sneaking a quick look at his watch as he did so. Sorry I'm a bit late, Mark said. Got caught up at the station. John nodded and led him down the dark hallway to the little room that he and Jagdeep had sat in last time. As was the case then, the drapes were down, the room close. Is this where it happened? Mark asked, looking around. This is where Jagdeep got the fright of her life? Yes, John said. I was out the back. Electricity wasn't working and I was trying to fix the fuse. She called me, apparently. But my hearing's not too good these days. I only got to her when I heard the crash. They both looked to the corner, where Phoebe Dixon had raced to hide, knocking over a vase and a footstool as he did so. In the mirror, she saw the reflection of him crouching there. She caught him, ran after him and dragged him down. That's when I came in. Philip shrieking and kicking, Jag Deep telling me to call the police. Calling you and then you on the phone. Oh, it was the strangest night of my life. Phoebe, or Philip Dixon, Jag Deep told Mark, had been stalking the Baber home for years. Not doing anything in particular. Taking photos, thinking of happier times, returning to where he used to go as a child, to places where he felt comfortable. He told the police that he liked to sit in the armchair where Gillian Baby used to sit. Sometimes he went there at night, he said, or during the day when John was out. To Mark, it sounded sinister. To most of the townsfolk in Cutter's End, however, it was the behaviour of a damaged yet harmless soul. Small towns and the law, who to protect and who to give up. He supposed it depended largely on reputation, on family. Briefly, he thought of Joanne, and how she had fared in Baralama. Philip was very fond of my wife, John said. She treated him many times for all his illnesses, and she was kind to him. He used to come around for little visits. They'd be having tea in the garden when I got home. He helped her in the vegetable patch, small jobs around the place. After she died, I knew he still came around here. Sometimes I'd find him looking in the window... That day you first came here, I thought I saw his face through the curtains. John closed his eyes for a moment. Gillian liked him. She felt sorry for him too. And that's a powerful argument in forgiveness. Maybe that's why the whole town let him do what he did. He was always going to be an outsider, so we gave him titbits of our lives. What's an illicit photo here and there when you've got no one to go home to? No one who will call you a friend. John was quiet for a moment, and Mark looked through the window, imagining faces there, innocent and not. He nodded for John to go on. When she asked him to take photos of Lynette, Michael's wife, I think she hoped he'd go around telling everyone, show everyone like he usually did, and make them act. There wasn't mandatory reporting for doctors then, remember. She was bound to silence. So, you did know your wife asked him to take the shots? I did. To my shame. I did nothing about it either. The men were quiet for a moment. But, Mark said, you did do something. Didn't you, John? I tipped off Philip when he got in trouble with the police for taking photographs, if that's what you mean. I told him to make copies of the important ones, and I meant the ones of Lynette Denby, of course, on a mobile phone. Even though I didn't do anything about them, I recognised that the photos might be important one day. She may have already died, but I hoped that in years to come, someone better than me would finally speak out for Lynette. I thought it might have been you who warned Phoebe, Mark said. Either you or Daryl. It was me. There was a short silence. 
But that's not all you did, was it, John? An old clock ticked above the mantelpiece. Outside, a bird shrieked in the evening sky. Mark could imagine purple streaks of sky like hands held up, waiting to be engulfed by the dark. John Baber clasped his hands together. I know, Mark said. How? The bonnet of Denby's car was up. The girls wouldn't have done that. They didn't. They were panicked. Traumatised, really. It wasn't until the roadhouse that they began thinking straight. John listened. You put the bonnet of Denby's car up, didn't you, John? To make it look as if Denby had been checking the engine when it blew up in his face. John sat still. Why were you late to the New Year's Eve party at the Cutter's End Backpackers? They were waiting for you to help get the lights going. You're never late. Everyone in the town knows that. Still, the man didn't speak. You didn't find Michael Denby on the 4th of January, did you? You found him on the 31st of December, not long after the girls left him. Silence. What did you see, John? What did you cover up? Outside, it would be fully dark now. Night came fast in Cutter's End. The lights of the three pubs would be turning on. Dolly Parton would be singing her sad songs. And Phoebe Dixon would be yearning to stalk forgiving streets. The clock ticked on. John looked at the photos on the table beside him and brushed some dust off the surface. When I saw the girls on the side of the road, they were terrified. I mean, I was terrified looking at them in the headlights. The blonde, well, she was sobbing, and the other was as white as a ghost. I turned around, picked them up. That wasn't unprecedented. I often picked up hitchhikers, especially after those sisters went missing. I worried for young women on the side of the road after that. But these two, I could see straight away that something was terribly wrong. Even after they quietened down, I was worried. But they were insistent. They said they were okay. The dark-haired one did the talking, and I didn't push. In those days, you just didn't. What did you think happened? I thought that maybe they'd been in an accident or seen something they shouldn't have. But they said no to everything, save for some minor, unsettling incident with the previous lift. Nothing out of the ordinary for then. They said they were okay. John rubbed the top of his hand, then stared at his palms as if they could tell him something. Mark waited. After I made sure that they'd got a room at the roadhouse, I turned around, started driving back to Cutter's. I still could have got to the party on time. I was running a bit early before I picked up the girls, but I couldn't stop thinking about them. It just wasn't right. I decided that I'd have a chat to Daryl when I got to Cutters, see if he could write something up, maybe check out who they'd got a lift with. But then I noticed, in the headlights, the track marks leading off the road. John kneaded his thighs. I followed the tracks, thought maybe there'd been an accident. But I had this feeling, this feeling and I knew it wasn't going to be good. Those girls, straight up, five or six k's in from the road. I saw Mick's truck and a body under it. It was windy as all hell, and I could smell petrol and something else burning. And when I ran over to Mick, I could tell it wasn't good. It wasn't good. John took a deep breath 
shook his head. His face was burnt to buggery and his leg was half under the truck. For a few seconds I remember just standing there, just not thinking. In shock, maybe. You didn't think to move the body? Cover it? John looked at him strangely. No, I didn't. Why not? He was still alive. Mark felt a jolt run through his whole body. Still alive? He clenched the side of the chair and leant forward. Mick was moaning, just moaning. And when I leant down to try to hear him, it was hard because his lips on one side were like bubbles. He was saying, help. And I think he said, water but I, I couldn't be sure. He was in a bad way, barely conscious. His hands were completely burnt, probably from where he tried to stop the flames on his face. It was... John looked at the darkening window. It was the most horrific thing I have ever seen in my life. What did you do? I went first of all to move the truck, get it off his leg, when I saw one of those spangly hair things on the ground, one of those big hair ties girls used to wear back then. The scrunchie, Mark thought. They all wore them in their hair. I saw that, and I thought of those two girls, and then I took a quick look around. There was cut-up cable wire, there was the tipped-over jerry can, the bits of material like a headband. And I knew. I knew what Michael had been up to. What he'd been up to all those years. And I thought about his wife, Lynette, and how Gillian worried about her. And how she said that no one ever did anything to help that poor woman. Nothing. I did nothing to help her. I saw those photos that Phoebe took all those years ago, and I did nothing. A private affair, we all thought. Best not to interfere. I looked at Mick there on the ground, writhing and dying, and I knew what had happened. My first thought was, those girls will never get away with it. Mick could probably survive if I took him to hospital right then. And he'd spin some story, and they'd all believe him. The police, the courts, the public. Now, it might be different. But then... He'd say they robbed him or something. He'd accuse them of being fast. John paused and pressed the side of his forehead. Mick said, help, to me. And he kept saying it, or trying to say it. And I thought of his poor wife while I pushed the hair tie in his mouth and shoved it to the back of his throat. I thought of Gillian, too, while he struggled and tried to scream. She'd been dead for less than 12 months, and why did she have to die? A good person. Someone who helped people. Why was she dead and not him? Michael kept moving, straining about in the dirt. But I held his burnt nose firm and I kept my knee hard on his chest. Till he stopped. Mark felt a deep weariness seep over his body. His bones felt old and cold, and he longed to be in bed, away from this place and the world. Then, John said, I tied it up. It was windy, so I knew footprints wouldn't be a problem. I covered my hands with a hanky and picked up the bits of cable, gave the vehicle a wipe down, 
retrieved the hair tie, moved the cigarette butt on the ground closer to the front of the vehicle, and then I lifted the bonnet up, poured the rest of the petrol on the engine, and lit it up. I thought you might have covered up the scene, Mark said. But as for the rest... Yes, I did the rest, John said. Then I drove to the backpackers in Cutter's End and delivered the fuel for the generators. A little late, but I made it. Mark recognised a faint pride in the other man's voice. Even at this point, he was pleased with his punctuality. You must have been surprised when no one found the body in the following days. John looked at him. I was. I kept waiting for someone to notice the vehicle marks off the side of the road. Even with the wind, they were still visible. But no one came forward. And then I thought that with every day it was buying us time. The girls and me. People started talking, of course, worrying where Mick was, and it would have seemed off if I, who travelled the road all the time, saw nothing odd. So on my next trip up the highway, I called it in. You weren't worried about someone seeing you on the 31st? Seeing the smoke from the engine burning up? I was past worrying about that. And remember, it was New Year's Eve. No one about. Quietest day of the year on the roads. Mark stood up to go, then looked down at the other man. What sort of man did you think you were when you killed Michael Denby, I wonder? John gave a soft laugh. <laughs> Have you been studying psychology? Reading Jekyll and Hyde. I see. Man is not truly one, but truly two. Mark quoted from the book. John looked amused. Ah, yes. Which part of myself did I display in those moments? Maybe my best side. Or not. I don't know. What do you think? Mark thought with immense sadness. It doesn't matter what I think. You're about to be charged. Chapter 46 After leaving John Baber and heading back into Cutters, Mark called Jagdeep, telling her he'd catch up with her tomorrow. She pressed, wanting to know what was going on. He deflected, told her he'd see her the next morning. Exhaustion seeped into his bones. Back in the dingy motel room, Mark collapsed on the bed. Strange dreams of people crying and burning and women in blue came to him. Someone singing, the scratching of animals in the scrub outside. In the middle of the night, he woke suddenly. A lone bird screeched, or perhaps it was a person coming out of the desert dawn. He didn't know. Unable to go back to sleep, uneasy from John's testimony and that of the women, he fired up his computer and searched for his final case report. As reluctant as Mark felt, he needed to add John's part in the murder of suspected murderer and rapist Michael Denby. He clicked onto his work folder, scrolled down to the date where he'd saved the latest file, the final report. Nothing. Mark frowned at the screen. He refreshed the page, searched again, wider this time, not just in the folder where he thought he'd saved it. A slight unease, a growing awareness. The file was not there. He'd saved it, knew he had, even copied it and placed it in another folder. That was gone too. It was, he thought, as if someone had hacked his computer and deleted both copies. Mark sat for a moment on his bed, stunned. It was late, but he looked at his phone. There was only one person in the world who knew his password, who knew the extent of the report. He jabbed in a text message. You wiped the report. Within seconds, despite the hour, his phone beeped loud in the night. A response from Kelly. Justice. You're a good man, Mark. Be just. What is justice? He thought. 
Perhaps in some ways, out there in the desert, it had already been served. The next morning, later than usual, Mark opened up another cardboard breakfast of stale cornflakes and poured warm milk over them. He needed a coffee and knew where to find it. In the early hours, a new report had been written up, dated, and sent off to Angelo. Superintendent Conti was impressed, pleased to stamp a conclusive finding on the case. No need now for a lengthy investigation into earlier police procedures. The South Australian Police Force was vindicated. This was exactly why, Angelo said when he phoned him first thing, he'd asked Mark to join the reinvestigation of the case. He was underutilised in fraud. Was he looking for a more permanent role in this area? Mark couldn't answer. Not yet. Have confidence in yourself, Angelo boomed to him over the phone. You're smarter than you think, Aridi. Perhaps he was, but not in the way Angelo thought. Already, too, he'd met with Jagdeep and Darrell, handed them his final report. Both agreed, based on what they discovered and what they had not, that in the case of Michael Denby, the reinvestigation's finding was accidental death. The burns on the palms of his hands and face, the motor explosion, the cigarette, the petrol, the sense dulling effect of the drugs. An accident and nothing more. The original finding? Correct. Hugh from the Port York Advertiser called. No results from the Can You Help Us advertisement as yet. The older bone fragments found near the site of Denby's death. Any more news on that? And did they have anything else on Denby himself, the unpopular hero from Cutter's End? Did they have anything, anything at all they wanted to share with him? No, Hugh. They did not. Jagdeep and Darrell did agree, however, that there was more work to be done on the forensic findings and on the files of missing persons dating back decades. The old copper's file with the missing people on it would be re-examined in painstaking detail. Police work. John Baber picking up hitchhikers, possibly even the sisters, was something they would continue to check out, although it didn't seem like much. Almost everyone they interviewed in Cutter's End who regularly drove the steward picked up people from the side of the road, out of sympathy, for company, to keep them safe. They concurred, John Baber's vehicle and the sister's, no discernible lead. A slight suspicion, perhaps, in his colleague's eyes when Mark told them about his reason for travelling up and meeting so late with John Baber? The boss needed loose ends tidied up and confirmation that there were no further areas of interest in the Denby case. Angelo Conti was obsessed with details, Mark explained, needed this reinvestigation wrapped up officially and finally in order to focus on police funding. Jagdeep gave him side-eye from the corner of the room but said nothing. After saying goodbye, Mark walked along the deserted main street, already hazy with heat, and on to the council offices mean-looking in the sharp morning light. There it was. He'd been meaning to find it. The plaque on the side of the building. Bronze and dignified. A small square, head height, adjacent to a rose garden and one of the few patches of lawn in the town. The commendation for Brave Conduct Medal was awarded to Cutter's End resident Michael Denby on the 26th of January 1986 for the rescue of a young mother and her child in dangerous floodwaters. This plaque was unveiled by Cutters End Mayor Noreen Parnell OAM on Australia Day, 1987. Mark wondered how it must have felt to receive such an award. Did Michael wish his wife, too ill by then to attend, could be there? Is there love when there's been violence? Does bravery equal goodness? By most accounts, soldiers from the First World War commended themselves admirably, helped to shape the Australian myth. Some returned home to beat their wives and kill Aboriginal people. Can one man be two? It had rained 240 millimetres in less than 24 hours on the day Denby rescued the Millers. It must have been difficult to see on that day. The rain, the swirling brown water with all its moving parts... It must have been noisy, the shouts, the people rushing to and fro, and all the time the little car circling slowly and tipping deeper into the fray. And there was Denby, diving down there into the rushing floodwaters, the desperate efforts as he broke the back window, 
the screams, the flailing arms. He did it, and no one else. If he hadn't done it, two females would not be alive today. A hero. And yet, not five years later, Michael Denby kidnapped two other women, tied one to a tree, and went about preparing to murder them. Years before that, he'd killed Isa and the two Cunningham sisters in between. Can one man truly be two? Perhaps the face, our outward self, was a great actor, as Jason Dimler surmised. Maybe when John Baber shoved that scrunchy far down Denby's burnt throat, it was a type of rescue. The image of the hero, intact for another 30 years. And who doesn't want to be remembered like that? Mark walked back to his car, got in and drove out of Cutter's End onto the highway, shimmering now in the mid-morning sun. He turned off the radio and wound down the window. Hot air rushed over him. Fine red dust filled the car. Land, immense and powerful, rushed on by. Clouds gathered on the horizon. A promise. A tease. John said that after the floods, the land took on a new life. Wildflowers sprung up all across the desert. Poached egg daisies, native geranium, eremophila. The pinks, the greys, the yellows. All that beauty, vast and uncontrolled. It must have felt like a gift. Just before the roadhouse, Mark slowed, parked on the side of the road, and took out his phone. Case closed. No more questions. He sent the text and stared hard at the screen. The car heated up and he waited, sweating. He was 16 again, waiting for a response from Ingrid Mathers. He tapped the second text, pushed send. You okay? Mark undid his seatbelt and got out of the car, stood in the burning sun. It took a moment for him to realise that there was no sound. No crickets, no rustle of the wind through trees, no traffic, no evidence at all of human presence. Silence. Rare and unsettling. But wait, was that a bird? Mark strained to listen wanting to hear the sound, a bird's call. Was that it? A high sound, somewhere around him, the shriek, perhaps, of a flock in the distance. He held his breath, focusing, focusing. But no, nothing. He exhaled. The land and its creatures, impervious to his needs, gave him nothing. He turned on his heel and got back into the vehicle. His phone beeped. A text. I'm okay. We're okay. Flight book to Amsterdam. Thank you. Already he could see how it would go for the rest of the trip. He'll drive. Think about Ingrid and Joanne and Isa, the sisters and all those missing. He'll watch the harsh beauty of the place and think what it must be to die far away from home. A thought will come to him of a blue high heel lying in the dirt, and he'll find it hard to let the image go. None of them will let it go. Back at the station in Carter's End, Jagdeep will be examining old articles, and Daryl will be pinning the photos of the sisters and at least two other girls on the board. People will be coming forward, There'll be more names to add. Missing persons, up and down the Stuart Highway. There are maps, photos, people to ID, old police files to go over. Lockhart's exchange principle. So much always to do. In his pocket, Mark could feel the creamy wedding invitation Jagdeep had passed him before he left the station. And already in his mind, he's left his lonely Adelaide home and he's travelling on this road up north again. He'll drive and drive, up from Port York, past the roadhouse, past the place of Isa's death, past the spinifex and the low sandhills. 
He'll drive and drive underneath glorious skies, and he'll make it, whether it be a few weeks or months' time. He'll make the drive all the way up the Stuart Highway and return to Cutter's End. Acknowledgements I'm grateful to everyone who helped in the creation of Cutter's End. This book was written mostly on dining tables in various houses, so for those family members who shoved their plates aside for my notes, who made me cups of tea, who yelled back when I yelled for quiet, and who read aloud over my shoulder giving mostly good instruction, I say thank you. I also say, I need an office. Thank you to early readers Bernie Dowsley, Marnie Witts, and Rosie Coop for their insightful comments, and to Kath, Paul, and Elizabeth for listening to my ideas. Thanks to Luke Reed for his expertise on cars, Dan O'Sullivan for his advice on guns, Mark Staley for all things police work, and Dr. Karina Moderman for sharing her stories of Dutch and Friesland life. A massive thank you to the wonderful Bev Cousins from Penguin Random House who first took on this book, and to Kalhari Jayawira for her sensitive and thorough editing. Thanks to Tatali Gottlieb, Claire Gatson, and all the PRH team. I'm fortunate to be backed by such professionals. Thank you to all the booksellers and librarians and readers. You make the world a rich and varied place. To my cousin Josie, who sat with me by the side of the road on long, lonely highways, listening to my stories while drinking Erin Cream. We shared it all. The good, the bad, and the creepy. Really, it was the time of our lives. Finally, and most of all, thank you to Bernie, Alexander, Eddie, and Ben. This has been a Penguin Random House Australia audio production of Cutter's End, written by Margaret Hickey, narrated by Henry Nixon and Bianca Bradley. Copyright Margaret Hickey, 2021. Production copyright 2021 by Penguin Random House Australia. All rights reserved. If you would like to find out more about Penguin Books Australia, our authors, upcoming events and new releases, you can visit our website at penguin.com.au.